The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda, please. Casino Control Commission invited testifiers Marvin Pickering, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Madam Clerk. CEO Pickering, I'll allow you to put your name and title on the record and then allow the two individuals who are here with you to do the same. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Marvin L. Pickering, Chairman, Chief Executive Officer of Virgin Islands Casino Control Commission. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Carolyn Herman Purcell, Commissioner, Vice Chair of the Virgin Islands Casino Control Commission. Thank you. Selma Dieterville Da Costa, Executive Director. Thank you. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, Honorable Kurt A. Vele, Chairman of the Committee on Finance, all honorable members of the committee, other honorable members of the 34th legislature, legislative staff, and those listening and viewing via radio, television, or the internet. For the record, my name is Marvin L. Pickering, and I am the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Virgin Islands Casino Control Commission. Accompanying me today is Commissioner Carolyn P. Herman Purcell, Vice Chair of the Commission, and our Executive Director, Selma Ditaville Da Costa. We thank you for the opportunity to present and discuss the fiscal year 2023 budget, for, budget requests for the Commission. The Commission is responsible for the regulation of casinos pursuant to the Virgin Islands Casino and Resort Control Act of 1995 as amended. Internet Gaming and Gambling pursuant to the Virgin Islands Internet Gaming and Gambling Act as amended. Racinos pursuant to the Virgin Islands Horse Racing Industry Assistance Act of 2011 and Casino Four Establishments Act permitted within the enterprise zones of Christiansted and Frederickstead. These statutes and all relevant amendments establish the basis for the governance and operations of the commission and its staff. Finances. The commission has four funding sources. One, the general fund for salaries of the commissioners and staff only. Two, the casino, con the casino revolving fund pursuant to 32 VI code section 514, which was amended by act number 7643 and by section four of act number 8184. This account is funded by casino and casino employee license fees, fines and other fees imposed by law or through regulation by the commission. Three, the Casino Revenue Fund, pursuant to 32 VI Code Section 517, which was amended by, Act, by Section 2 of Act Number 8577, and is funded by the 12% tax on gross revenues from DV Carina Bay Casino and Resort and VIGL-CRG, commonly referred to as Caraval Hotel and Casino. With the amendment to 32 VI Code Section 517, the Commission now receives 25% of these taxes, with 75% allocated to other government departments or agencies, including 1% to the Commission for programs to treat and prevent gambling addiction. And four, the Horse Racetrack Casino Revenue Fund, pursuant to 32 VI Code, Section 901. It must be noted that the Commission has not received funding from this source since 2016 when Traxco ceased operations at the Randall Dock James Race Track. <clears throat> As it relates to the general fund, the commission's personnel, the total sum we are requesting is $995,700, which represents 15 employees, including three vacancies. The vacant positions are for one commissioner to fill the seat vacated by former commissioner UCR Richards and two new positions, an in-house legal counsel and an IT support specialist. The table below lists the names and related information for the employees of the commission. The Casino Control Revolving Fund is a special checking account that serves as a depository of monies collected from all license, registration, and permits fees fines, penalties, and other fees, all sums appropriated thereto by the Legislature of the Virgin Islands, and all donations, gifts, and bequests. In this fiscal year, 2022, from October 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2022, the Commission collected $64,545, of which 80% 
or $51,640 was allocated to the commission and 20% or $12,905 was allocated to the Department of Justice, Division of Gaming Enforcement Operating Account for their operating expenses relative to gaming enforcement. The signatories on this account are the commissioners and the Attorney General of the Virgin Islands. Regarding the casino revenue fund, in fiscal year 2021, the 10% appropriated to the commission from the Department of Finance was $164,732.05 as compared to $156,376.92 for fiscal year 2020, an increase of $8,355 or 5% year over year. The first two quarters of fiscal year 2022 yielded $126,000. $553.25 as compared to $99,354.29 for the same period of fiscal year 21, an increase of slightly more than 27%. The second quarter report below from the Department of Finance for fiscal year 22 shows the percentages and amounts distributed. The funds were distributed to the Roy L. Schneider Hospital, 1F Louis Hospital, Hospitals and Health, Myra Keating Smith Clinic, Education, Worker Prep, EDU Program, High School, Youth Programs, Agriculture, Tourism, Casino Promotion, St. Croix, Union Arbitration and Increment Fund, Bureau of Internal Revenue, University of the Virgin Islands, VI Alliance for Responsible Gaming, Sports, Parks and Recreation, Casino Control Commission, Public Safety, and the Casino Rehabilitation Fund. The distribution for fiscal year 2019, fiscal years 2019, 2020, 2021, and through the second quarter of fiscal year 2022 can be found on the Commission's website. It is worthy to note at this juncture that Act Number 8577, Bill Number 34-0224, Section 2, Paragraph B5, enacted on April 22, 2022, amended 32 VI Code Section 517 to reallocate the percentages to the various agencies and entities. The percentage to the commission was increased to 25%, with 75% appropriated to the other agencies, a reduction from 90%. 90%. This amendment also eliminated funding for other programs. Of particular note, the youth program's appropriation that provided funding as mandated by 32 VI Code Section 518 for financial assistance to casino employees to further their education and funding for the Jobs for America's Graduates Virgin Islands JAG-VI programs, which will be discussed later in the testimony, both were defunded. The Horse Racetrack Casino Revenue Fund has not provided any funding since Traxco ended Racino operations in May of 2016. Thus far in this fiscal year, the commission has received $8,356 in federal funds through Vitima as reimbursement for damages from the hurricanes of 2017. The cost reimbursed covered payments for vehicle damages, minor internal building damages, and replacement of some office equipment. As mentioned earlier, the Commission administers the youth program's funding in compliance with 32 VI Code Section 518. In this current fiscal year, the Commission funded this program to the tune of $335,975 as requested by the Department of Labor. It was reported recently in the media that this program was awarded a national state award from the JAG National Network for the class of 2021. The commission wishes to congratulate the Departments of Labor and Education for this outstanding achievement. This program, along with educational assistance for casino employees, will no longer be funded through the Casino Revenue Fund due to the amendments made by Act Number 8577. Currently, we are in the process of reestablishing the VI Alliance for Responsible Gaming. The Commission had discussions with former members of the Alliance to determine their interest in serving again, but have not received any firm commitments. It is our intent, 
with the assistance of the National Council of Problem Gaming to at least resume the public service announcements to inform gaming patrons who believe they have problem gaming as to where they can obtain counseling and other assistance. A financial overview of the commission by bank accounts for the period October 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2022 is inserted for your review. Administrative actions. As previously reported, the commission's website is operable and can be found at www.casinocontrolcommission.vi. The site currently contains the laws and regulations governing the, the operations of casinos, laws and regulations governing internet gaming and internet gambling, the commission's bylaws, the commission's code of ethics, licensing requirements and application forms for casino and hotel employees, casino operators and vendors, application for casino hotel alcoholic beverage license, voluntary exclusion from casino gambling instructions and application, fee schedules, casino revenue fund reports for fiscal years 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and through the second quarter of the current fiscal year 2022. Responsible gaming link and information about the commission and the division of gaming enforcement. All applications on the website are fillable and provide easy access to the licensing process for employees and the human resources departments of the casinos. On February 28, 2022, the commission issued its second annual report to the governor and the legislature of the Virgin Islands. The report was issued in accordance with the provisions of 32 VI code chapter 21, section 424, and can also be found on the commission's website. In addition, on August 3rd, 2022, in accordance with the mandates of 32 VI code chapter 21, section 514E, the commission, for the first time in its history, submitted to the Commissioner of Finance the quarterly report for the Casino Revolving Fund. As was mentioned previously, the Casino Revolving Fund is a special checking account wherein all license, registration, and permit fees, fines, penalties, and other fees are deposited. The funds are split 80% to the Casino Control Commission and 20% to the, to the Division of Gaming Enforcement for the operating expenses of both entities. The signatories to this account are the members of the Commission and the Attorney General of the Virgin Islands. Further, the Commission now provides monthly financial reports to the Attorney General and the Director of Gaming Enforcement detailing the revenues and expenditures related to the revolving fund. It is the Commission's intent to continue to abide by the provisions of this and all applicable laws governing the Commission. The Commission conducted timely hearings for the review of casino licensees and issued a permanent casino license and a permanent operating certificate to VIGL CRG Caravel, effective July 14, 2020 through July 14, 2024. The Commission also issued a permanent license and operating certificate to DV Carina Bay Casino and Resort, effective February 2, 2020 through February 1, 2024. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Commission adopted a COVID-19 contingency plan based on the input of both casino operators and national standards established by, the, by casino regulators and operators. These protocols included physical modifications to the gaming facilities, safe social distancing and sanitizing measures to ensure the health and safety of patrons, vendors, casino employees, commission employees, and the employees of the Division of Gaming Enforcement throughout the casino and hotel facilities. Enforcement of these mandates are the duty and responsibility of our casino inspectors who remain the eyes and ears of the Commission at all gaming facilities. On April 13, 2022, the Commission modified these protocols with the casino licensees to be consistent with the provisions of the Governor's 36th Supplemental Executive Order and issued, order issued on March 14, 2022. Both casinos continue to advise the Commission of any occurrences of COVID-19 exposures. During fiscal year 2022, there were no casino patrons that were 86 deed, which refers to persons ejected or banned for improper conduct in a casino. 
However, there were five patron complaints, six voluntary self-exclusions, and two names placed on the permanent exclusion list. The commission has secured the services of an independent hearing officer who will preside over matters such as these when warranted and make recommendations to the commission for final disposition. The commission still has concerns regarding the efforts to solicit and promote casinos in the territory. It is our contention that the responsibility for those efforts fall to the Department of Tourism. For the fiscal years 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and the first two quarters of the current fiscal year, a total of $390,024.59 was disbursed to the Department of Tourism, quote, for tourism and casino promotion for St. Croix, end of quote. The Commission will continue its efforts to engage with the Commissioner of Tourism to ascertain exactly what the Department of Tourism has done or plans to do regarding their statutory mandate to promote the casinos on St. Croix. In prior testimony before the Committee on Finance, the Commission reported that web cash management has been reestablished at Banco Popular de Puerto Rico, a service that is only accessible to the current members of the Commission and requires approval of at least two commissioners to access the funds. Also, as was stated in our last budget testimony in August of last year, the commission has implemented a financial management system that provides for the timely entering of invoices, billings, and payments issued by the commission. The FMS system is overseen by the commission's chairman and chief executive officer and executed by our executive director and executive assistant. The Commission has established quarterly payments to the account of the Division of Gaming Enforcement, DGE. These payments represent the DGE's 20% share of fees collected in our office via credit card payments and deposited to the Commission's operating account at Banco Popular. The Commission is current in those payments to the DGE, with the latest payment being made this past July for the third quarter of the fiscal year. The Commission has no outstanding past due invoices and our only outstanding payments are for current goods and services procured over the immediately preceding month. However, due to questionable transactions of a past chairman, the Commission is liable to repay to the Youth Programs Fund a total of $39,878 improperly spent from the fund. In addition, the Commission is also making payments to Banco Popular on a credit card that was issued to the Commission with that same former chairman as an authorized user. The balance amounts to $47,740 with scheduled monthly payment of $1,141 deducted from the Commission's operating account. The Commission is located at number 3005 Estate Orange Grove, Christensted, St. Croix. The building is leased from the Government Employees Retirement System, GERS, and consists of approximately 4,667 square feet of gross leasable area. The Commission remains current with our rental obligations to the GERS. The Commission and the GERS concluded negotiations on the renewal of a new lease agreement, which was executed by the Commission on September 27, 2021, and by the GERS on October 5th. 2021 for a term of one year, expiring on October 4th, 2022. There is an option to renew for an additional term of one year. The Commission has notified the GRS of its intention to exercise the option as required in the lease agreement. The Commission and the Division of Gaming Enforcement, under the very capable leadership of Attorney R. Oliver David, Director, have successfully addressed a backlog of applications that dated back to March of 2019, some 121 of them. However, this situation remains tenuous at best, as Director David continues to remind the Commission of the need for additional staffing to avoid delays in conducting the necessary background checks and investigations of applicants for licenses. The Commission issued licenses that included both new and renewal for all categories to include casino employees, casino key employees, gaming-related entities, and non-gaming-related entities. The table below shows a comparison of licenses issued by the Commission for fiscal year 2021 and thus far for the current fiscal year. 
A color-coded ID system for the issuance of all categories of work permits was implemented by the Commission a couple of years ago. The system addresses all employees licensed by the Commission, casino inspectors of the Commission, and office staff of the Commission. The ID includes a photo of the employee and an expiration date, and it must be visibly worn by all employees while on duty. The color codes are casino key employees, light blue, casino employees orange, hotel employees white, casino inspectors red, commission staff and commissioners dark blue. The commission's inspectors, special assistant for licensing and compliance, and commissioners have also been issued appropriate badges that align with their respective duties. As expressed last year at our budget hearing, the Commission thanks this body for adopting the recommended amendments to the Internet Gaming and Gambling Law of the Virgin Islands, 32 VI Code Section 21, Article Roman Numeral 14. It is the intent of the Commission to impl implement the provisions of this Act. This law has been on the books for close to 20 years and has never been fully implemented despite previous attempts to do so. The Commission has engaged the services of a contractor, industry-renowned Gaming Laboratories International, or GLI, to review the current law and rules and regulations which must be updated to reflect the current environment of the industry with the new technological changes and current processes that have evolved since the enactment of our statutes. The Commission will submit any recommended revisions or amendments of the laws to this body for its consideration. Major concerns. The Commission is concerned with the lack of full staffing resources for the Division of Gaming Enforcement to meet its mandates. The DGE is a critical component in assisting the Commission to fulfill its regulatory obligations. As mentioned before, the previous backlog of applications was addressed, but it is in serious jeopardy <coughs> of reverting to the previous condition if DGE is not fully staffed. Although not a part of the Commission's budget, the Commission is advocating on behalf of the DGE that the legislature fund the necessary positions to assist the DGE to perform its duties in a more efficient manner and ensure the continuous revenue flow to the government of the Virgin Islands. The Commission does not have a full complement of commissioners as there is a vacancy for a commissioner from the St. Croix District. On April 20th, 2022, the term of former Commissioner UCR Richards expired. And I take this opportunity now, on behalf of the Commission, to publicly thank Commissioner Richards for his service, and we do indeed wish him well. The Governor has been apprised of this situation on several occasions, and we await his action on this very serious concern. The Governor, to his credit, did appoint, and this body did confirm on March 24, 2022, an individual from the St. Thomas St. John District in the person of our Vice Chair, Commissioner Carolyn P. Herman Purcell, who filled the vacancy that existed following the resignation of former Commissioner Stacy Bourne. Another major concern is the lack of a long-term lease at our current location. The Commission is currently leasing space from the Government Employees Retirement System, GRS, as previously mentioned, and we are unsure if our one-year lease will be renewed as we requested to the GRS in our notice that we wish to exercise that option in our current lease. If the Commission were to be displaced, this would be very problematic since the Commission does not currently have funding to purchase or construct its own building, which would be the best option in our considered opinion. Finally, the Commission has requested funding for two positions, an in-house legal counsel and an IT support specialist or lead. In regard to the legal counsel, 32 VI Code sections 408D and 412G mandate the Commission to hire legal counsel and that Ideally, such counsel, quote, shall devote his or her entire time and attention to his or her duties and shall not pursue any other business or occupation or other gainful employment, end of quote. 
with any other business or occupation, I'm sorry, with the myriad of issues, including the review of the gaming and gambling laws that require the commission's constant attention, an in-house legal counsel would provide the commission with an important resource and allow the commission to have ready access to legal services and guidance in fulfilling its statutory mandates. Regarding the IT support specialists, the commission is in the process of updating its IT infrastructure to include the replacement of servers, computers, scanners, and camera systems. As technology is constantly changing, there's a need to remain vigilant of the changing environment and keeping pace will be challenging without having such requisite expertise on staff. I would be remiss if, on behalf of the commission, I did not express our thanks and gratitude to this body, particularly you, Mr. Chairman, and Madam Vice Chair, Senate President Fred Gregory, for following up on your promise to assist the Commission with funding for our IT upgrade, which funding was included in Bill Number 34-0226, now Act Number 8590. Thank you so very much. Our thanks and appreciation as well to Governor Bryan for signing the measure into law. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the testimony of the Virgin Islands Casino Control Commission relative to its fiscal year 2023 budget. The representatives of the commission stand ready to respond to all questions you and the members of this body may have to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Colleagues, we're going to go directly into a five minute round, beginning with Senator Marvin Blyden. You're recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon. Commissioner Pickering, and thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you spoke to um, Mr. Richards' um, resignation, and do you see you still have one vacancy when it comes to the commissioner, correct? That is correct. Yes. Uh, somebody close this door, please. Senator Joseph, your mic is on. Yeah. Okay, very well. Um, in respect to the commission, how many how many other vacancies do you have? Because I know you spoke to um your challenges with enforcement. How many more vacancies do you have on um, the agency? In addition to the vacant commissioner uh, position, we have two more uh, vacancies which we are asking uh, funding for. That's for an in-house legal counsel and an IT support specialist. You spoke to the in-house legal counsel and the job description in terms of them not being able to have any other jobs, et cetera. What, what funding are we looking at in terms of um, salary for that individual? What's the number? Yeah, what the are, ask? I'm sorry. Uh, we're looking to range from uh, between eighty to $100,000. And I, I, so you think that, that would be enough to um, retain someone where they cannot have any other jobs in that area? Yes, that's what's specified in the uh, statute. Correct. And, and what are you paying for legal services right now? Um, do you have that on contract? What that amount you extend at this time on a regular basis? Uh, we, I believe that uh, currently, so far this fiscal year, we have paid about $85,000 for, for legal uh, services. Okay. Okay, so it will fall within a and range of um, your active income. I'm sorry, that is through um, through July of uh, this fiscal year. Okay, very well. So it will fall within the same um, amount of what you're paying out on contract. Okay, let me ask um, also in respect to your inspectors or when it comes to enforcement, how how critical of a role they play as an agency, and what are you doing in that respect? Uh, as I stated, uh, the uh, inspectors are the eyes and ears of the commission. They are on the casino floors, and they are there to, to make sure that the uh, rules are being observed, and um, any patron complaints are to be uh, are submitted to them uh, to, to be referred to the, to the uh, commission. And the 172,000 that you're requesting above last fiscal year, is that to fill all those, um, those vacancies? That, that is amount? correct. That is correct, Senator. And and that will cover it because, remember, you know, you're looking for a legal, um, an attorney or also um, 
inspector, the two 172 on, is enough for that, for those two no, areas, no, along no, with no. benefits? Uh, I'm sorry. The, um, the request is for $162,000, 100, up to 100000 for for legal counsel and 62000 for an IT support specialist. No inspectors. Okay, very well. Thanks for the clarification. Um, in, you spoke also, and you mentioned in terms of uh, the your, your job responsibility in terms of uh, doing inspections to other areas, as you spoke to, and you said you spoke to um, us in the past in that respect. Uh, with that extra responsibility, do you have the capacity right now as is to fulfill those, that mission? I didn't get um, your your uh, previous statement. I just heard the last question. Could you repeat that, please? You spoke in your testimony as to um, uh, when we had the, the bill with the um, horse racing bill, you spoke to um, what you feel you guys should be doing in terms of um, inspection, et cetera. And, and I, I, I'm asking you, with um, the current staff you have, do you have the capacity to do those extra um, inspections, et cetera, and enforcement of those other machines? The um, inspection of uh, gaming machines, uh, yeah. Senator, uh, that's, mm -hmm. a respons that's a responsibility as well, or the prime responsibility of the uh, Division of Gaming Enforcement. They are the ones that, um, that uh, would, would uh, conduct and audit, audit the machines. Uh, and as I mentioned, they are, um, they are somewhat uh, on the staff. I believe that uh, the director was asking for, for two, two positions um, that would um, enable them to, to perform the uh, requisite duties, you know, of um, or what they're charged, charged with, the responsibilities, the character responsibilities that they're charged with. Time. And in closing, Mr. Chair, I know that you do not have any outstanding um, vendor payments. I um, appreciate that. And you do not have no um, other outstanding obligation. Is that correct? Well, I, I did mention that uh, in, in terms of uh, our goods and services, no, we do not have any outstanding uh, invoices uh, except for what was uh, procured in the um, immediately preceding month. But I did mention that um, we do have obligations to the um, a repayment of some uh, 39000 to the youth programs fund because those funds, you know, under a, a, a prior commission, uh, some uh, those funds were, were improperly spent, and uh, regarding the youth, the youth programs and also a credit card obligation, also from the previous commission. And are you up to date with your with your repayment agreements? Are you up to date with your repayment agreement? I'm sorry. Are you, are you up to date with the payment agreement, the, the schedule? Are you up to date on your payments when it comes to the agreement? Uh, well, uh, yes, we are, but uh, there was no formal agreement. Uh, the, the, uh, the money was owed, and the, the bank decided to um, deduct it from, from the account. Uh, they were uh, improperly deducted it from the youth fund, the, the youth programs account, which we had them stop and uh, transfer those deductions to the operating account. How much, do, how much do they deduct on a monthly, a monthly basis? $1,141. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the leniency. Thank you for your responses. Thank you, Senator Blyden. Uh, page five of nine of the post audit report. Uh, the, the figures that we have there reflect the period of October 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. Do you have more actuals? More, uh, more recent figures? Uh, yes, sir. Can you tell me what is the GBI payroll contribution? Through, uh, through, through the second quarter, I believe that amount is $934,913.77. We take again $934,000. Nine hundred thirteen dollars and seventy-seven cents, and that's total payroll contributions, base salaries, and fringe benefits to the third quarter. To the third quarter. Okay, and the payroll is paid from the general fund. That is correct, Senator. 
So your numbers are off in terms of what you're projecting for this upcoming year. You projected 900 and 995 you projected. But 995,700, you're already at that number with the third quarter. Not exactly. Um, for some strange reason, and, and I don't know what, what it is, they are, they are budget has, all, has always only shown the base salaries and not included fringe. But fringe, the fringe benefits are paid. Okay, and that's my point. Right. So my, my point is, is that if you look at even what you had here, 646,000, you double that. I mean, that, that's almost 1.3 million. That's 1.29. Yes. So uh, the, the, the fringe and the payroll comes out of the general fund, out of the government. But we, for whatever reason, it usually only show the payroll and not the fringe. Correct. So your act should not be 995. Your act should be... Actually, nine ninety five plus four twenty eight. Actually, one point four million dollars. Correct. Correct. But I, I was just being consistent with how the budget is being presented. No, but we want to just make sure we do it right, so we know because what what has happened for but years, that, and sorry. we tried to correct it um, last year when we increased the amount because before you were getting what um, four hundred and sixty six thousand, but we realized before you were there, oh, okay. they only gained almost five hundred thousand. But we realized that the government was responsible for the payroll and was actually paying more. But the numbers were always wrong. So we tried to correct it last year, but now we realize that fringe wasn't included, so we need to correct it this year and move it to the 1.4 so that we could clearly reflect what is coming out of the general fund. And so, the cost of operating the commission. Correct. You know, and and if uh, in, in our budget submission, uh, uh, Senator, we did, in the uh, projections, we did include, we did include uh, those uh, fringe costs. Okay, so we are going to, uh, colleagues have to make that, um, that, that change. If we don't, then it's still coming out. So we just need to show what, what, what we're actually paying based on the number of employees that we have at the Casino Commission. Senator DeGraff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers. Uh, I, I will start right there because I was going to talk about that uh, you had 13 employees. Presently, you have 13? Uh, we have... Uh, and no vacancies with, with 13. Then you added two positions, you said? We have 12 with three vacancies. 12 with three? Yes. Okay, because you had a, your budget was 833.7 in 22. That is correct. Okay, so that, that's what, based on the post added report, of 22, that's with 13 employees. Now you add a commissioner, a legal counsel, special assistant, and another casino inspector at 48,200 vacancy. Okay, uh, at the time that we submitted uh, our proposal, the, uh, there, there was in fact a vacancy for an inspector that, um, that had resigned in between when we submitted the, uh, okay. the uh, proposal uh, or the projections, uh, we rehired that inspector. So the, the vacancies, the vacancy is, vacancies are uh, up to, th uh, have been reduced to three. The commissioner, the vacant commissioner from the St. Croix district and the in-house legal counsel and the uh, IT support specialist. Okay, so your act should be 1.1 and then personnel and then fringe take you to the 1.4. That is correct. The one hundred and seventy-two in a in, in, in a walk. Okay, I'm sorry? so now are, are there any wage increases or anything looking at for the employees? Uh no sir, not at this time. Not this time. Okay, okay, because yeah, so that that, that threw me off too when it came to the personnel. Now, um, for the property, what, what are you paying to Sun Self Storage? Uh, we do not. Uh, we uh, do not currently uh, have a, a storage with Sun Self Storage. I think that was um, discontinued uh, sometime last year. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Costa? 
Yes, of, uh, of May 31st, 2021. Okay. Okay, and, and then I noticed also you have two vehicles, uh, 2010 and 2011. Uh, are they still in good operational? We disposed of the uh, 2010 um, uh, vehicle, uh, and we acquired a 2022 uh, Ford Explorer. Um, so we, we, still, we, we have that, and then we have the 2011 Ford, Ford Explorer. Two what's minutes. The what's the condition with 2011 Explorer? Uh, let me say that we need another one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, that, 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 that it's, that's it's where you it's, it's fair. It's fair. It's that's fair. That's where you're here to ask. And, and, and again, it's for your, okay, because you have two vehicles, you have uh, three, three personnel, uh, three inspectors. Or is two, mm. yeah, you have three inspectors. Uh, we have, uh, is that five? Five inspectors. Five inspectors? Yes. Okay, so okay, so with five inspectors and one and a half vehicles, so at least a vehicle it should be an ax um, to give you at least three minimum. The um, currently the commission does not assign vehicles to the uh, inspectors; they use the personal vehicles. Okay, to to make the inspect. Okay, so the. Okay, so I, I, I got you on that. But again, for liability issues, at least it's there if it becomes an issue. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so then, um, so you don't pay the lease. Okay, now for the lease with um, GRS, they mentioned somebody, they stopped doing a five-year lease, so it's strictly just a year to year. And if you don't renew... You, are you have any place in mind to move to presently? Not at the moment, Senator. Um, but as I said, it is a concern, and it's something that we really have to um, prioritize. Uh, if in fact uh, we don't get uh, that that uh, term, the term of release extended uh, going forward, then you know we really have to to make an effort to to see if we could uh, find another location. Okay, and, and you will be allowed a month-to-month -month extension, not per city year, but at least a month-to-month -month while you search, or, or, or was any conversation done in regards to that? Uh, no conversation was done uh, in regard to that uh, uh, right Time. now, but uh, in the past, that's, that's what it was. Prior to us signing the, um, the uh, new lease uh, last year, that was uh, the, um, the uh, terms, month-to-month uh, -month um, until we had secured a new lease. Okay, and finally, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, then you would budget, how, how would you budget in terms of rent? Would you have it budgeted for at least six months to a year? Well, we... Just uh, in case? We, we, we currently budgeted, have uh, budgeted uh, $84,000 annually for, for rent okay. payments. Yes. Okay, going forward for the next year? Well, what we currently 22. have, what we currently have. And it would cover any an extension. It's, I just want to make it clear. No, we, we we currently have a lease that expires in October of uh, uh, this this year. We have requested. We have exercised our option for one additional okay, year. Okay, good. So that would cover it. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator De Graff. Uh, the, the amount that I'm coming up with for the ass, um, so your pick rent is one million four hundred twenty-three thousand eight hundred. That is correct. Okay. That includes personnel and fringe, and includes um, the additional, well, the, the commissioner, the vacant commissioner position, the vacant for the new legal counsel, and you had one more position that you were asking for your IT something. IT support specialist. IT support specialist. So, and, and that number is correct. Uh, One million four twenty-three eight hundred. Okay, perfect. Senator Saro. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, Judge Purcell. How are you? I'm oh, well, Senator. How are you acclimating to to the role? I'm acclimating. I've 
very well with the assistance of Mr. Pickering and the executive staff, but it's a lot. I, I'm learning so much. I mean, you're never too old to learn. You spent you know, you oh, no. time on the bench. I'm so. glad you told me that. I'm never too old to <laughs> <laughs> continue in learning. You're going to have a little CLE in, um, <laughs> in casino. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, Mr. Pickering, your, your fringe is at 46 or 48% calculated to total of 1.4. Sorry? Your fringe. You're calculating your fringe for your personnel at what? 46 yeah. or 48 percent? Uh, 46 percent, I believe. 46? Yeah. Okay. Now, just, just briefly on your testimony on page 6, you highlighted the um, Act 8577, and you indicated that it, it really causes some critical programs to be defunded. So what's your suggestion for that? Now we... Well, that we, we change the percentage or that we just repeal? What's your suggestion? Well, we certainly appreciate uh, our appropriation being increased <laughs> to from, from the 10% to 25%. So uh, there will have to be another funding source, um, uh, preferably not from the, from the casino Revenue you fund, want your money. But, but um, <laughs> there, there will have to be another funding source to, 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 um, to, fund, those, to fund those programs. Okay. So, so you're okay with the increase in your funding and your recommendations as you find a new funding source for, for JAG and um, the other programs? Yes, Senator. Okay. Nice to see you fighting for your funds. Now, quickly, operating supplies based on a post report. You don't have any... Um, you didn't have any last year. Is that correct? Audit. Page four of nine, post added. Operating supplies. There's a dash. Oh. You didn't need any, you didn't use any funding for operating supplies last year? No, this is our. Uh, is that because you had the FEMA funding? That's why it was. That's why that is zero. No, no. Um, at the time, this is from uh, that uh, column you're looking at is the actuals, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the actuals, and up to, up to that point, um, there were none. So up to March, you didn't. It was zero. Right. Okay. Let's let's go to your travel as well. That's, is that adequate? Is that accurate, sorry? The 38,000 and 12,000? Uh, probably not. <laughs> What's the correct number? Uh, through, through May of, um, of this fiscal year, mm -hmm. we had a travel expense of $4,442 and training, uh, which will be uh, combined with training and conference dues of another $6,523. So in those categories, you need us to bump you up then? Sorry? In those two categories, you need us to really bump you up? Well, um, the, the, uh, those, those expenses uh, are not funded by the, um, by the uh, general fund. It's not, it's not funded by the general fund, correct. Right. But the, these, these come from the operating, re from, from, the, from the revenues. Operating revenues the other revenues, uh, the um, revolving fund primarily that we use for operation expenses. Okay, so you're not going to, based on your expenses, you don't exceed anything, right? No, no, we, no, we have not. No, let's I, look. I, I don't project that we'll get uh, uh, for, through the rest of the fiscal year past the, um, what was budgeted uh, uh, for last fiscal year, uh, for this fiscal year, rather. Okay. And then before my time is called, let's talk about your electricity. What are you, what's your projection for electricity? Because I'm seeing every agency, whether they're semi-autonomous, autonomous, or, or government, the cost for power is budgeted less in a year of inflation. Uh, our electricity costs 
time. Well, your projection is 25, right? Um, last year was 21. But is this, I just wanted to, to, fi to ask if your projection is within the correct ballpark. Yes, based on, you know, based on, um, you know, our prior spending and given, given uh, uh, some expectation of, uh, of an increase, yes, we, we, we suspect that we, I, I think we, we budgeted higher than we did um, in the prior uh, fiscal year. Uh, Mr. Chair, just one more question. I don't know if it was said in the testimony, if I missed it. You had any audits conducted recently? No, uh, we have not, but it is uh, our intention that, uh, to, uh, and, and according to the mandates, you know, of the, um, of the law, we are to have an audit of the revolving fund uh, each year, and I plan to do so um, at the end of this fiscal year. Okay. Good. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, um, Senator Syro, Senator Carla Joseph. A pleasant good day, uh, Commissioner, and also Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Uh, Commissioner, I want to uh, really thank you so much for all the hard work you do. I really appreciate uh, the work that you have done in giving funding to the, uh, I think it was a JAG program. I recall the Department of Labor mentioned how you were able to pay a number of young people who participated in the uh, JAG program during their internship or their hands-on training, uh, on-the-job training. And I really want to commend you and the commission members for taking a strong uh, position to support workforce development in the Virgin Islands. I really deeply appreciate that. But I do have a concern, and you raised it before, you talked about it regarding these same youth programs. I noted on page 13, follow me to page 13, that you indicated that due to a previous chairman, the commission is liable to repay the youth program fund a total of $39,878 that were improperly spent from the fund. And in addition, you also have to make payments to Banco Popular on a credit card that was issued to the commission um, from that same former chairman of $47,740. And you're making monthly payments of $1,141 from your operating account. So do you have sufficient money in your operating account to, to pay that down? Because if you're making monthly, that's going to take you at about a significant time, over three years, maybe three, four years to pay that off. Well, you know, we we're hoping that 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 they would have the uh, have that funding um, uh, to 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 make those payments. Uh, with you know, with the increase in our appropriations, you know, from the revenue fund, you know, uh, we will make every attempt to do so. But you're correct. Uh, uh, if the if the funding allows, you know, we we could you know accelerate those payments because it's uh, uh, particularly with the credit cards. Uh, with the current card payment, you know, it's um, it's uh, interest is being charged, so it'd be to our benefit to to quickly um, pay that off. Where in your budget do you have it listed in your projected budget those costs? Because I'm trying to find out in the budget that you put together how you are absorbing it and if it's in your accounts payable or receivable. Where do you have it? are listed that that's an outstanding cost that you need to pay. It is uh, a payable. Um, Two minutes. That, uh, that is shown on our uh, balance sheet or our statement of net position. Uh, and um, those, uh, those payments are not, if I remember correctly, are not uh, shown on the budget. As an, ex as an expense. It's not shown on, on the budget? No, it's not. Okay. 
for me, I like to see those things in on the budget because it, it gives us a good idea of what is outstanding. Do you project that you're going to be able to accelerate the payments given that you've given uh, gotten an increase in your amount that you are going to receive based on the act, your percentage? That is our expectation, Senator, yes. Okay, great. Now, I wanted to ask you regarding your insurance coverage. Is the insurance coverage you have only for the automobiles because you don't own any buildings? No, that uh, the insurance uh, is for the, uh, which is required by our landlord. And it's uh, commercial general liability insurance. The uh, government, okay. to my knowledge, doesn't have insurance on the um, uh, on the vehicle, I could be wrong, but uh, no. The, okay, the, the that's one of the insured. things we have to look into uh, because you are a commission. You need to have your own insurance. One of the other commissions that came before us, they have their own insurance and a vehicle uh, so that you are covered. And so I would recommend that you include that. Um, and really, that's really part of what we need to be doing in government is especially with the vehicle insurance, because then how will these persons get their money uh, if or who is injured? Who does the liability goes to? Well, it is, you know, we are an uh, independent uh, agency of the executive branch. Um, yes. So I suspect that it would fall to the, to the government. You are independent agency. You said right. the key word. Yes. Okay, so you should have your own vehicle insurance. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your leeway. Thank you, Senator Joseph, Senator Fred Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the Casino Commission leadership. Good afternoon, um, I believe the questions were exhausted, but I still want to go back oh, oh. to... So, Senator, your, your camera is off? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's on. You can't no. see me? No. It's on. Let me turn it off. Is this the bandwidth? Let me turn it off and turn it back on and see if it comes on. Can you see me now? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, that's me. My time starts again, right? Thank you for that. Um, so... Let me just ask, because most of the budget questions were pretty much exhausted. Uh, but, you know, the, the question, the elephant in the room is, we've been at this for a number of years, well over, what is it, 20 years? Some 20 years, right? Are there any discussions about any new casinos uh, coming into the island district of St. Croix? I think it's an important question. And, you know, in the intent of the legislation was to ensure that at some point the Casino Control Commission would be able to stand on its own. It is an independent entity. And 20 years later, we're still having a $1.4 million um, obligation to the government. So talk to me about, you know, what are we really doing here? As we, as I understand it, uh, Senator, the commission is a regulatory body. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the the um, function of promoting uh, casinos that was mandated uh, to the uh, Department of Tourism. You know, right. we, we regulate the casinos uh, the um, going out and promote and, and advertising or promotion and all that stuff lies with a different agency. Okay, so we need to ask them, but I think I coined the question wrong. I was supposed to ask you, are you aware of any um, developments? That was the question I really needed to ask. And I, just yes or no. If there's it's a no, it's a no. No, I am not. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about your licensing and permitting fees. Uh, when was the last time they were updated? We, uh, right now, we have uh, 
with the Office of the Attorney General and what's that division? Um, uh, um, solicitor? The Solicitor General, Pamela yes. Temper. It's SG, Solicitor General. Yes, uh, we have um, the uh, rules and regulations uh, being reviewed for, for uh, promulgation. We, um, we updated those, I uh, believe, uh, a year a year or two ago, but no reg no regulations were, were issued at the time. So, and we so submitted a fees? Fees? Yeah, I'm yes, speaking yes. about fees. Fees. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, fees. You're correct. Fees. Okay. So that those were inclusive of an update? Uh yes. That's an affirmative? Yes. yes, Senator. Okay, so if you are seeing an update uh, based on your 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 um based on your profit loss statement, if you will, um, are you seeing any residuals at the end of the fiscal years. And I'm asking that question because if we are seeing an overage on the general fund side, then that money should be flowing back up into the GE to cover any excess um, expenses or excess uh, amounts that were that are outside of the budgeted amount. Two minutes. The, um, I think it's page nine of the uh, post audit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it shows that there was a um, sur sur surplus, if you will, for, for fiscal year 2021 of $203,276. Mm -hmm. so what is, when was your last audit, though? Because your audit has to show what the true um, numbers are. So when was your last uh, audit for the commission? The last audit I know uh, of the commission is what the Inspector General performed uh, a, a, a few years a few years ago. So, uh, so as an independent agency, you are aware that you should have uh, financial audits on an annual basis, correct? That is correct, and which I stated before, we we intend to do that after this fiscal year. Okay, so you're not you see so you haven't done an actual financial audit for FY 2021 or 20 outside of the Inspector General. I'm not talking about. The IG audits. I'm talking about financial audits. That is correct. Uh, none was done. Okay, so you shouldn't wait until after the fiscal year. That should be something that's occurring as we speak, as you came on as the um, uh, as a member of the the Casino Commission. Um, that's your background. Audits have to be done. Uh, that that's a must. How can we have, you said it's an independent entity, there's no audits as financial audits as being conducted. How do we even know any of this that's in front of us is accurate? You if we have no financial audits as being conducted. You must understand, uh, Senator, that the financial records of the Casino Control Commission were in total disarray prior to my coming on and prior to um, uh, uh, Commissioner Richards. And those that, records, that those, prevent, those records. Let me just, let me wrap up. Let me wrap up because my time is going to be called. That does not prevent the Casino Control Commission from conducting. Let's not get mixed up between um, Inspector General audits and the responsibility of financial audits. If you conduct your financial audits, then you have an opportunity to see exactly where the entity is and where it should be going. Time. If you have not conducted any financial audits, then um, you truly don't have a picture of the organization regardless of all the other things that occurred outside of that was not good let me just let me just leave that right there so you know as the lead i believe that you know that that should be something that should be occurring normally as you know uh when you audit you want to audit at least two years we now have two full years we will now have two full years of uh accurate financial information and as I stated to a uh, question uh, or comment uh, earlier, that it is my intention that at the end of this fiscal year, uh, fiscal 2022, we would solicit bids for an audit of the funds as mandated by law. Okay, my time has been called. Are you saying 2020 and 20, 2021 and 2022? 21 and 22, that's correct. So then you should have already started your 2021 audit. That's basically what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Senator Fred Gregory, Senator Gittins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to all. Good afternoon, Senator. 
afternoon. Welcome, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Senator. <laughs> we still call you Your Honor. Yesterday we had uh, Ms. Holman. Now today we got Ms. Holman again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner, uh, how often does the uh, commission meet? Uh, at least quarterly. And when you say quarterly, when are those dates? Uh, well, we don't have any set dates. We, we set aside uh, uh, different months each quarter. Um, we, we project Bless out, you. We project out when we'll meet, but we don't have a set date as to when we would... Um, when was the last time the commission met? Uh, that was when? We met sometime... Please uh, put your name and uh, title on the record before you respond. Selma Dieterville da Costa. We met in May. What, what's your title? Selma Dieterville da Costa, Executive Director. I'm sorry, Senator. Okay. Go ahead. When was the last time the commission I'm met? I'm sorry. June. We had a, a commission meeting. June of this year? Yes, sir. And when was the last time prior to that? April. April. Okay. So when is your next meeting? When is that scheduled? It's scheduled for October. October? Good. So we're well on the road. Uh, do we have a full commission at this time? No, we do not. We How have, many uh, members do you have currently? Two. Two? Yes. And yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's a three-member commission. We have two currently. Two members currently. Mm. So when you meet, it's just both of you? Yes. The... Um, so we're still down to one and a half casinos still in the territory? Uh, as far as I know, we have two. What are we, we doing have, to... We have DV and we have Carville. What are we doing to attract any um, casinos to the territory, if any? The commission is not doing anything to attract casinos because that is not right. the commission's I, 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 responsibility. Let, strike, I, strike that. Okay. Are you aware of any uh, casinos interested in coming to the territory? No, I am not. All right. And um, like I said, it, uh, I mean, you call it two, but I call it one and a half. You regulate that at least one and a half okay. casino in the, in the territory, is. correct? On the island of St. Croix, in particular, which is the casino district, correct? That is correct. Are you in a position to tell me the economic impact uh, to this territory as it relates to uh, employment and or uh, local spending. W one, one second, Senator Gittin. Senator Fred Gregory, please unmute mute your device. Go ahead, you may proceed. Yes. Um, Do I need to repeat that or you? No, 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 I, I think I have it. You want to know what the economic impact of uh, the uh, casinos uh, is in the um, territory. Uh, in terms of total spend, uh, goods and services uh, pro procured by the um, boat casinos uh, in fiscal year 21, or calendar year 2021. 20, uh, Two minutes. Total spend was about uh, $24 million. That's what's spent by the casinos in terms of goods and services and whatever other expenditures uh, they may have. So far, this is... Is that locally? Uh, I, I, total spend. Some of it may not, may, may not be local, you know, but um, uh, in terms of total spend, according to their reports, this is what uh, they have spent. This is what they spent in, um, in 2021. So far, this, um, in, up to the second quarter of this year, uh, it was about $10 million, $10 million in, ter in terms of total spend. Now, in terms of the employment, uh, I believe you asked that, um, so far in 2022, both casinos have about uh, a little under 300 employees. And uh, in terms of salaries, they have spent, um, they have paid about four and a half million dollars. If we go back to uh, 2021, um, that uh, total payroll for, for casinos was about $7.4 million with a little under 250 employees. So you think that drop is uh, due to the pandemic? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Do you uh, suspect that it will increase uh, once again? Yes. Um, 
the uh, trend I was seeing uh, uh, based on the uh, second quarter, although you know the, the, the casinos are in fact having a difficult time uh, with the uh, attracting employees, which is a you know global problem, quite frankly. Um, we we do expect that um, that would increase the, at our last meeting. The uh, folks from uh, DV had indicated that they were employing some some uh, I, I don't want to call it innovative, but some additional efforts to to attract employees to the territory. There's a Time. Div division. Uh, may I conclude here, uh, Mr. Yes, Chair? Yes, There's a division of gaming enforcement. Uh, uh, under your entity, is this um, position filled uh, by a director? And what is the um, how many employees within there? What's the positions? Uh, gaming enforcement is uh, under the Department of Justice. Uh, they um, but, but they they work directly with you, correct? Yes, but but their budget is under Department of Justice. I, I, I understand. Right. Is there a Gaming uh, Enforcement Director. Yes. Uh, attorney R. Oliver David is a director. Okay. Um, and how many people are uh, assigned to that office? I believe he has uh, four, including himself. Or maybe, yeah, four, four, including himself. And what's the position titles? Oh, uh, Gaming Technician, Researcher. Um, so and, who the inspector? So who do the inspectors work for? The inspectors work for the, for, uh, for the commission. For the commission? Yes. How many inspectors do you have? Five. Uh, and and that, that's actual positions, not, not just... Um, yes. There are none bodies, of them are vacant. There are bodies in them, yes. Five. Okay. Uh, bodies in the positions. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Uh, time has been called, so I'll, I'll put the pin there. Thank you uh, for your responses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the latitude. Thank you so much, Senator Gittins. We actually just funded those positions for gaming um, enforcement last um, cycle, last budget cycle, where they requested some additional positions, so we're able to fund that. So I think they're uh, fully funded now to be able to uh, fully operate and deal with all concerns in reference to gaming. Senator Carrion? Yes, Senator Gittins. Uh, th thank you for that reminder as well. Um, and when we had the Department of Justice, I um, uh, failed to, to ask about the Division of Gaming Enforcement, but I'll be doing um, follow-up on that because, again, enforcement is uh, crucial uh, with this industry in the territory, and we can't afford for it to, to, to get out of... Um, out of whack because I'm already uh, trying to talk with you all to see how we could best approach this uh, one gaming entity in the territory. Bingo, uh, wherever, lottery, wherever it is, we should be looking at one gaming uh, industry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, lottery, Racino, simulcasting, um, Casino gaming, VLTs, everything should fall under one entity. Uh, what is a office of gaming? And a lot of states have moved in that direction. And they have one entity that oversees everything, and then you could have a lottery office underneath and other entities. So I think we need to move in that direction. I wanted to ask Judge Purcell, um, and I'll call you Judge because you earned that. What, what, what is your view on casino gaming on the island of St. Thomas and John? In the, in the island districts in Thomas St. John? It's not a budgetary question, but it could become a budgetary <laughs> no, question. No, it's not a budgetary question. Um, it, it would generate revenue, so it could become a, quite a budgetary measure. It, it's a policy question. It is. And I don't believe it's a policy question, and I'm, I'm not prepared to address that at this point, Senator Bailey. Um, I'm, I don't believe I've been on the commission long enough. I'm still trying to understand. Um, I've not even hit my six-month probationary okay. period. So maybe a little later in my term, I could then be more informed, more knowledgeable to okay. address that. I think it's something that we need to um, begin to think about. 
um, overall for the Virgin Islands as to exactly what direction we want to move in. Uh, definitely, we know that St. Thomas probably have five times the amount of tourists that, that, that come to St. Croix. And gaming originally was uh, one of the mechanisms to get the half island money to be able to gamble and stay on the island. So uh, the best place to get the half island money is the island where the bulk of the tourists um, go to on a regular basis. So it's something that we need to discuss, I think. Um, somebody has a measure in reference to that. So hopefully we'll see whether or not it comes to the floor and whether or not we could have a discussion as to, to whether or not it makes sense. If your legal counsel was here, I would ask a question as to uh, whether or not the contract with uh, Southland Gaming would prohibit casino gaming and St. Thomas. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I, you know, I've heard this discussion before about um, placing all the gaming activities under, uh, under one entity. And I think that it deserves uh, some careful study before, um, uh, and, and if that's gonna be a proposal, a, a study would be a prerequisite to uh, having, mm -hmm. that, um, having that done. We gotta look at the pros and cons. And you are right, because uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I was thinking about that, you know, with how it's constituted now. Uh, you know, here we have the casino uh, district of St. Croix, and then there was recent uh, 8577, which uh, uh, extended mm -hmm. that, um, the, uh, the contract. And you know, how would that work, you know, given what the, casino, uh, the casino's authority is right now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what's happening uh, in uh, the St. Thomas and John district? Okay, and, and, and I asked that question because I had a discussion with uh, Mr. Jacobs or Lottery um, in reference to the situation, and he said that um, they had referred the situation to the Division of Game and Enforcement under the AG. So right there you can see where it really overlaps. So I'm saying, hey, um, we need to just refine it. I think when, we, well, when the bills were originally, originally offered, um, it was for casino gaming and St. Croix for X amount of years, so this could be exclusive and we could lower hotel development, but it's been like 30 years now. So it, it's a totally different realm and we need to see what direction we're gonna move in. Senator Gittins. Point of inquiry. Point of inquiry. Direct, uh, Commissioner, uh, have there been any uh, discussions uh, with the chief executive in filling that uh, third vacancy? Uh, within the commission, uh, yes, the uh, the governor has been uh, notified, you know, unless uh, you know, on at least uh, two or three occasions, and uh, he has indicated that he's working on it. But you know, we we, we still await his his action. How long has this uh, vacancy been open? This uh, current vacancy since April of twenty April of this year. April of this year. Yes. However. But, uh, uh, when was the um when was that uh term up that it person was, was serving yeah. until uh the new commissioner came in but when was that term up uh his term was up uh, i believe it was december 14th of 2021 but the law allows 21 correct so yeah, what i'm what i'm saying is is so although he just left in April, we know that there was a vacancy from from before when he was leaving in December of 21. So hopefully uh, we, we will um, have someone named to the position uh, soon. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gittin, Senator Carrillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good, good afternoon to the Virgin Islands Casino Control Commission team, um, and um, certainly welcome the new commissioner, Judge, uh, welcome, on, welcome on board. Uh, let me ask both commissioners, um, what challenges, have it financial or otherwise, have you faced or encountered since you've been appointed as commissioners? To both of you. <laughs> Senator has been, um, I've seen, had no challenges in the time I've been there since March of 2024. Um, everybody has been, it's been pretty smooth sailing for me so far. So 
Um, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I guess you've been also recently appointed. Yes, yes, yes. yes. in March. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I can't say that I'm recently appointed. I was appointed in late 2020. But, but my, uh, my number one challenge, you know, was always um, the uh, financial reporting, you know, based on um, the, the Inspector General reports and, you know, it's well publicized what, you know, what happened. Uh, so uh, that, that, that challenge was addressed, so first of all, to um, have the proper financial reporting with proper financial statements, uh, transparency um, in terms of uh, there should never be, you know, uh, in, the, in this commission and, and, and there won't be, you know, under my leadership where only one person knows the finances of the, of the commission. You know, um, the commissioner uh, receives uh, uh, fin copies of the financial statements, monthly financial statements, the executive staff. Receive, receive, uh, receives copies of the financial statements. You know, we, as I indicated in my testimony, the, um, the uh, Division of Gaming Enforcement, the Attorney General, uh, they receive copies of the financial statements, so uh, with the proper uh, documentation. So uh, there is full transparency, and we are going to, to continue to, to maintain that. Uh, one of the, the, the other challenges that we had uh, was um, in terms of the IT infrastructure um, of the of the commission, which we are working on, and again, I uh, my thanks and appreciation to to, to this body for uh, for funding for providing funding for our IT upgrades, and so um, uh, other than those, you know, they, you know, we 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 are moving right along. Can okay, based on uh, those findings, uh, of course, we all know from the. IG, uh, what have you implemented, what procedures or policies have you implemented to kind of correct some of the problems? I know you mentioned some of the things about the, fin you know, sharing the financial reports, um, transparency, but are there anything, any regulations that you have established? Two minutes. And procedures. And, and, and prior to my, uh, to my coming on board, uh, the, uh, those uh, audit findings were addressed by the uh, by prior, prior commission um, and, and commissioners, uh, for example, um, two signatures are required um, on, uh, on checks uh, being issued, uh, access to the uh, online uh, uh, cash transfer, which is called uh, web cash management. You yeah. know, there must be two commissioners, uh, commissioners and not staff, but two commissioners that would approve any uh, uh, transfers, electronic transfers. Uh, such as that, and then again, uh, not to be um, redundant or repetitive, um, the sharing of uh, the uh, financial information. Financial reports. Yes. Very well. Um, in the post audit report, page four, exhibit uh, number one, um, you have their professional services. Uh, and budgeted for FY22, you have 225000 uh up to March 31st of this current year, uh, it seems like you have expended uh, 83,313. Uh, but when I go to exhibit number eight on page nine, that gives a breakdown of professional services and contract contracts. Also, uh, actuals up to the 30, March 31st, the total I see here is 63,742. I don't know if it's been asked before because I did step out. Um, can you kindly maybe explain the difference? Uh, can you repeat those pages again, please, Senator? Uh, Post audit report, page four. Page four. Uh -huh. Professional services. Okay. 83,313. Then when you go to exhibit eight, page nine, on the professional yeah, services yes. contract where you yes. have the breakdown, 663,742. So this, there's a Time. difference uh, between what's reported on page four and the breakdown detailing professional services contract on page nine. 
I am not sure if uh, on page, and it looks like on page, on page four, there might be, looking to see if there were other. Um, you do have some areas that are in blank on page nine. Uh, there's no amount given for Ronald W. Belfon, Esquire, it's in blank. There's nothing for gaming laboratories, that's also in blank. So I'm not sure if you're missing some figures here for Mr. David IT Services, that's also in blank. In terms of uh, Attorney Belfon, uh, he's, uh, he was recently uh, contracted to perform uh, independent hearing officer duties. Has any I, payments been given to? No, no, yeah. no payments have been no made payments to, to Okay. You know. And gaming laboratories, any payments? Uh, no, no payments. Thus far? Uh, no payments to gaming laboratories. They have not completed their... Uh, their the IT, um, Mr. Review. David, any payments? Um, that's For FY22. Do you pay anything to David? One that we have with professional fees? Yes. Let me see if we find that for you. Uh, I don't believe we made any. Okay, that back. Nothing was paid to David uh, in this fiscal year, uh, Senator. Okay, so uh, you know, there's a approximately almost a twenty thousand dollars difference here. Yes, nineteen thousand five hundred and seventy-one. Um, yes, I, I, I cannot, um, I cannot explain why the post audit, uh, you know, uh, amount is higher uh, than uh, what we reported through March. Hmm. But if you'd like, you know, I would uh, do an analysis of that and submit that inf information to you uh, later. Yes, please. Uh, so do you believe that you'll expend the 225000 that's been budgeted for FY22 for uh, professional services? No, not so Not so far. We spent... Um, what are your actuals to date? You have your most recent actuals for June? Yeah, through, through uh, August 5th, we have expended $124,000 in our uh, professional fees. Very well. Uh, and lastly, if I may, Mr. Chair, I know my time has been called. If you could uh, provide some information regarding to um, the youth program account, what is it used for and uh, what was the purpose for the disbursement of 340940 That was um, amongst paid to the Department of Labor to support the uh, Jobs for America uh, youth programs. And um, this, they, they submit to us, you know, uh, the, the law requires that we provide 50% of their uh, budget for that program. So that was paid directly to the to, uh, to Department of Labor and to, to support that program. They, I know that they, it's after school programs, it's training for, um, for, for, for uh, youth programs, for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but we don't control that. that we, we just submit the funding as requested to the Department of Labor. Gotcha. Thank you very much uh, to both of you commissioners and to the Executive Director for the work you all are doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you. And thank you so much, Senator Carrion. Uh, CEO Pickering, I'm going to allow you to put a closing statement on the record. I think we have exhausted all of our questions. I'll allow you to close at this point. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and to all the honorable members of this body for the opportunity to present our, to the Committee on Finance the Casino Controls Fiscal Year 2023 budget. It is our fervent hope that you and the members of this body could favorably consider our requests for the added positions that are necessary to enhance the operations of the Commission. We should thank my colleague, Commissioner Herman Purcell, for her assistance, guidance, and input during this uh, budget preparation process. 
And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank the staff of the Casino Control Commission with a heartfelt thank you for their continued professionalism and their efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Vicker. And the Committee of Finance will take a 15-minute recess.
The Committee of Finance is back on the record. Uh, next before us, we have the Waste Management, the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority. Roger Merritt, Executive Director, I'm going to allow him to put his name and title on the record. And then I will allow the members of his staff that are here in the well and those who will be participating virtually to put the name and title on the record. Let's begin with you, Mr. Merritt. Good afternoon. My name is Roger Edward Merritt, Jr. I'm the Executive Director for the Waste Management Authority. Thank you. Next. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Colwood. I'm the HR Director for Waste Management Authority. You do it again. One more. Sorry. Erica Colwood, Human Resources Director, Waste Management Authority. Thank you. Good afternoon. Florence Kahugu, legal Chief Legal Counsel, with VI Waste Management Authority. Okay, and you're probably going to need to take off the, the mask, that's what we have there. Okay. Yeah, so we can hear you clearly. CFO? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Daryl Griffith, Chief Financial Officer, Waste Management Authority. Thank you. Uh, let's go to those that are participating virtually. Eloise Brown? Good afternoon, Eloise Brown, Territorial Grants Administrator. Alex Rooney? Good afternoon, Alex Bruning, Engineering Manager, Southern <laughs> Jeffrey Watson. Good afternoon, Jeff Watson, Engineering Manager, Wastewater Waste Management Authority. Juanita Isles, thank you. Good afternoon, Juanita Isles, Territorial Grant Administrator. Thank you so much. You may proceed with the testimony, Mr. Murray. Okay, good afternoon. Honorable Senator Kurt Villay, Chair of the Committee on Finance. <coughs> okay. One minute. Um, everyone that's participating virtually, please mute your device. Uh, Mr. Bruni, please mute your device. <coughs> Okay, we're good to go now. Good afternoon, Honorable Senator, Senator Kurt Villa, Chair of the Committee on Finance, other members of the 34th Legislature, the media, ladies and gentlemen, and listening and viewing audience. I'm Roger E. Merritt, Jr., Executive Director at the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority. I'm appearing before you today, along with Daryl Griffith, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Kahugu, Chief Legal Officer, Luis Sylvester, Chief Planning Officer, Erica Carwood, Human Resources Director, Jeff Watson. Pull, pull, pull the mic down and speak directly into uh, speak directly into the mic. Hello. Uh, to speak like this. Try it again. Um, good afternoon, Honorable Senator Kurt Violet. Okay, go ahead. Okay, keep keep going. Um, let's see, so I'm um, appearing before you today along with Daryl Griffith, Chief Financial Officer, Florence Kahugu, Chief Legal Officer, Louis Sylvester, Chief Planning Officer, Erica Carwood, Human Resources Director, Jeff Watson, Wastewater Engineering Manager, Alex Bruni, Silo Waste Engineering Manager, Juanita Isles, Territorial Lead Grant Administrator, and Eloise Brown, Territorial Grant Administrator to provide testimony relative to the authority's proposed fiscal year 2023 budget. <coughs> Senators, this morning ev everyone here got up and flushed our toilets without worrying about where the contents would go because the Waste Management Authority was there to remove this wastewater directly or indirectly from our residences, businesses, and villas, keeping our community free from communicable disease like cholera, E. coli, and hepatitis. The Waste Management Authority takes this mandate to provide solid waste and wastewater collection treatment and disposal services to protect health and uh, preserve the environment of the U.S. Virgin Islands very seriously. Our team helps to prevent a public health crisis on a daily basis. Annually, over 2 million visitors come to our shores by air and sea to experience a piece of paradise, <clears throat> making our tourism-driven economy 
one of the most robust in the Caribbean. Every, every report that we read placing us at the top of the tourism industry could not happen if the people of the Waste Management Authority were not there to keep paradise clean and sanitary. After every carnival and festival event that we celebrate as a community, BIWMA is there to clean up the environment as our motto states, we are proud to preserve paradise. The Waste Management Authority by its nature is not held in high regards by most people when ranking government services. The community understands the critical role that it plays in making our society livable and enjoyable only when sewer lines are backed up or when garbage is piling up at bin sites. The paradise that we long for and the clean, pristine environment we all desire cannot exist without a strong and well-funded waste management authority to, to dispose of things that we import, which subsequently become trash, or the human waste that must be disposed of, generated from the millions of visitors and residents who enjoy living and visiting the territory. I make these statements, these statements with all humility, <clears throat> but I feel quite comfortable saying the Waste Management Authority is one of the most important agencies in the territory and must be treated accordingly. Finance. The executive, team the executive team understands that finance is a key factor in effectively managing the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority. The Authority's Financial Division in the last five months has completed the Authority's 2018, 2019, and 2020 audits. The Authority plans to complete its 2021 and 2022 audits by April 2023 and therefore be in compliance with the timely filing and submission of all financial audits. The government of the U.S. Virgin Islands has recommended an appropriation of $35 million from the general fund to the authority for fiscal year 23. However, the true cost for the authority to provide solid waste and wastewater collection, disposal, and treatment services alone is nearly $40 million annually. So technically, this means the general fund appropriation does not cover all the necessary costs, such as uh, waste management personnel, machinery and equipment, emergency repairs and maintenance, et cetera, to, to effectively provide these critical services. Uh, vendor payments. We are constantly communicating with the solid waste and wastewater service providers to determine all outstanding debts owed and have begun requesting and receiving account statements to accompany their monthly invoices. The authority has paid out over $42 million to contractors in, in fiscal year 2022 and has tremendously reduced its accounts payable to local contractors. Payments to the solid waste service providers from the $15 million appropriation, Bill 33-0375, were processed as outlined in the legislation and in accordance with direction from the authority's board of directors. I want to personally thank this Senate body for the $35 million annual allotment that has been paid timely and consistently, along with Governor Bryan for the $14 million allotment that was used to pay local solid waste contractors. The Waste Management Authority has made great strides, but the authority needs the Senate's help in getting to the finish line. The authority currently owes approximately $28 million to local contractors for work performed from the years 2017 to 2022. A one-time appropriation of $28 million will make all the contractors who help the authority provide solid waste and wastewater collection, treatment, and disposal services both during and after the hurricanes and during the COVID pa uh, pandemic. With your help, we can drastically turn around the financial picture of the authority on solid waste. <clears throat> the authority manages the territory's solid waste collection, transportation, and disposal network. Municipal, municipal solid waste is collected from bin sites, convenience centers, public receptacles, and curbside, and is ultimately disposed of at the Bavoni and Anguilla landfills. Approximately 500 tons per day of waste is disposed of daily, and over 180,000 tons of waste is disposed of annually in the territory's landfills. The average Virgin Islander produces approximately nine pounds of trash per day, which is almost 40% above the U.S. average, and the authority is preparing to eliminate the majority of the public unmanned bin sites throughout the territory as they lend themselves to illegal dumping and pose environmental and public health risks. The plan is to construct and operate convenience centers throughout the territory, similar to those found at Mandal on St. Thomas and Peter's Rest in St. Croix. Community Development Block Grant Disaster Relief Funds from the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority will be utilized to construct the new convenience centers, which we anticipate will begin in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022. Federal Grants Unit for Solid Waste, so the CDBG Dash DR tranche two funding, uh, the authority subrecipient agreement with the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority 
in the amount of $22 million provides funding for the implementation of designated projects outlined in the tranche two action plan under the housing and urban development infrastructure repair and resiliency program. These activities are directly tied to the damages related to hurricanes Irma and Maria. Specifically, these projects are new convenience centers for the territory, the expansion to the southeast portion of the Anguilla landfill, and the Anguilla landfill closure phases one through seven. The authority is pleased to report that it has received the convenience center application approvals for the following six out of seven convenience center projects from the Virgin Islands Housing Finance Authority. Uh, one, a state Concordia convenience center, St. Croix, two, Montbijou Convenience Center, St. Croix, three, Cotton Valley Convenience Center, St. Croix, number four, Red Hook Convenience Center on St. Thomas, number five, a state, Bay, a state Smith Bay on St. Thomas, and number six, Susanna Berg on St. John. We anticipate the estate Bournefield site to receive approval within the next two months. Bill number 34-0192 in July of 2022 and other crucial bills were successfully passed establishing zoning changes and lease agreements of these properties with the support from the members of the 34th legisla legisla legislature and government house. The approval of these measures was critical to the success of the establishment of the convenience centers across the territory. As part of the integrated solid waste management plan, these convenience centers are a critical part of recycling and waste separation in the territory. They will be designed with measures to ensure waste is collected in an organized manner to prevent hazards to public health, public safety, and the environment. The sites will be fenced to prevent illegal dumping and will be staffed by knowledgeable and helpful attendants. There will be multiple collection areas at the convenience centers to allow for segregation of specific types of waste to support source separation methodologies and a recycling program. Additionally, in the CDBG DR tranche two funding, are the expansion to the southeast portion of the Anguilla landfill on St. Croix and the closure phases one through seven. The southeast extension will directly increase needed airspace and allow the authority the time to select and build a new municipal solid waste facility on St. Croix and the CDBG tranche three allocations. The proposed closure of the Anguilla landfill will comply with the existing Department of Justice consent decrees. And the, so the total landfill budget um, with the Southeast Extension and the Angola landfill um, closure phases is $40,924,339. The total budget for the convenience centers is $17,887,881. Uh, the construction of the new St. Croix disposal facility and the expansion of the Bavoni landfill along with the pre-construction activities, including land acquisition, surveys, environmental assessments, permitting, civil site work and stormwater management design, landfill design, design of on-site waste disposal and recycling facilities, and design of on-site support facilities will be funded through the tranche three CD, CDBG-MIT funding. The uh, VIHFA is in the process of creating the CDBG-MIT application. Federal Emergency Management agency public assistance funds. The authority has continued to work with local and federal agencies to review damages and formulate projects, resulting in the obligation of 16 FEMA category A and B solid waste projects to date. These projects total $16,095,847.05. 10 projects have been reimbursed, five fully reimbursed and five partially reimbursed. The total reimbursement to the authority thus far is $11,651,946.55, along with $355,827.55 through insurance proceeds. Currently, project worksheets amounting to $4,088,072.95 are being reviewed and are processed for reimbursement or payment to the authority. Uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Solid Waste Supplemental Grant, the Department of Planning and Natural Resources um, and, and Waste Management has been awarded a so solid waste supplemental grant in the amount of $10 million, of which Waste Management received $6 million and DPNR receives $4 million. The funding was provided from the US EPA under the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, uh, which are intended for states affected by the two Category 5 hurricanes in September of 2017. The grant will support the further development of the solid waste management program in the territory and develop and implement a sustainable waste aversion materials management program. 
Currently, Waste Management and DPNR are finalizing the memorandum of agreement, establishing the terms and conditions and all activities included in the designated projects outlined under the program. Uh, the Waste Management Authority expects to receive the notice to proceed in October of this year. Waste Management is working collaboratively with the Virgin Islands Department of Planning and Natural Resources to plan, design, and implement an integrated sustainable materials management pro program under this program. This project will address the management of post-storm solid waste and develop a long-term sustainable materials program that addresses historic shortcomings and increases uh, preparedness for managing waste materials from everyday life and future hurricanes or other natural disasters. Waste management intends to develop waste diversion programs that focus on extending the life of useful, useful materials and the permanent removal of several waste streams that currently end up in the territory's landfills. Through public education and outreach programs, convenient disposal, and legislation, it is the intention of waste management to implement long-term initiatives that will be geared towards making waste diversion part of all Virgin Islanders' daily lives. Tipping fees. In August of 2017, Tipping fees using a volume-based methodology were approved by the Public Service Commission and implemented in the St. Thomas St. John District, generating approximately $17,000 in one day. <clears throat> Due to a disagreement with the St. Croix Solid Waste Service Providers, the process was temporarily halted, and because of the destruction caused by Hurricanes Irma and Maria that year, the territory-wide plan was never realized. In December 2020, the plan was again proposed to the PSC, and in June of 2021, PSC approved the tipping fees territory-wide using the volume-based methodology for fiscal year 2022. The collection of tipping fees was implemented on January 10th, 2022, and to date, the tipping fee revenue is nearly $1 million. Uh, the actual um, was $971,300.38. Wastewater. The authority's facilities collect, treat, and discharge nearly 4 million gallons of wastewater per day. St. Croix accounts for approximately 1.6 million gallons per day. St. Thomas accounts for approximately 2.1 million gallons per day. And St. John accounts for approximately 130,000 gallons per day. Our wastewater infrastructure in St. Croix consists of 120 miles of sewer lines, 15 pump stations, approximately 1,800 manholes, and one wastewater treatment plant. For the District of St. Thomas, St. John, there are 300 miles of sewer lines, 15 pump stations, approximately 2,500 manholes, and seven wastewater treatment plants. The GVI and the authority are close to fulfilling the 30-year consent decree. Veolia operates the Harold A. Thompson and Pedro A. Francois wastewater treatment plants, and the contract expires in 2027. The authority has started to identify staff in, in fiscal year 2022 for training needed to operate both plants upon expiration of the contract and release from the consent decree. This will result in a, a potential annual savings of approximately $3.5 million. Federal Grants Division, Wastewater, Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA continues to assist waste management with emergency repairs, maintenance upgrades, and permanent repairs to the wastewater infrastructure territory-wide because of the major damages sustained after the 2017 hurricanes. Waste management has repaired and maintained our wastewater treatment plants, pump stations, and gravity sewer lines. Waste management continues to work side by side with our recovery partners, FEMA, Vatima, ODR, and Wood O'Brien in reviewing damages, formulating projects, and working towards project completion. To date, 39 wastewater projects have been obligated at a cost of $46,902,263.16. Our total project balance is $40,724,383.93. This balance consists of projects in the design phase, pending bid proposal, ongoing construction, pending FEMA extension approval, level two FEMA review, pending alternate project, 10 draw packages, finalization, and prudent replacement architecture and engineering designs. Most recently, we have been awarded $30 million for the, the architectural and engineering designs for the entire St. Croix wastewater infrastructure. We are currently preparing in conjunction with our consultants, Wood O'Brien, the scope of work and cost estimates for 15 large and small pump stations, Harold G. Thompson wastewater treatment plant, and gravity sewer lines. This project is estimated at approximately $2.1 billion to upgrade the wastewater infrastructure to industry standards. Department of Interior, the Interior Capital Improvement Program. The authority was awarded $402,739 under the U.S. Department of Interior 2019 Capital Improvement Grant Program by the Virgin Islands Office of Management and Budget. 
This grant has a performance period of five years and expires January 31st, 2025. Under the 2021 Capital Improvement Grant Program, Waste Management has been awarded $705,977, and this grant expires September 30th, 2025. Now, 2019 grant funding, Waste Management has been working with DOI in providing all necessary documentation needed to assist the agency in getting closer to the issuance of a notice to proceed for the Humbug 1 pump station maintenance upgrades and a can crime pump station force main sewer line repairs. The project is pending National Historic Preservation Act Section 106 consultation and no historic properties affected concurrence approval. We anticipate once this review is completed, a notice to proceed will be issued by DOI and construction will take approximately 12 months to complete. 2021 grant funding. <coughs> Harold G. Thompson Wastewater Treatment Plant, UV system upgrade. Uh, authoriz authorization to proceed was issued by DOI and the overall project cost is estimated to be $1,015,977. Additional funding of 310,000 through the American Rescue Plan Act is pending approval. Department of Interior Maintenance Assistant Program. U.S. Department of Interior has awarded waste management $535,000 under the 2020 Maintenance Assistant Program and $267,996 under fiscal year 2021. This grant has a performance period of three years and expires September 30th, 2023. Under the 2021 Maintenance Assistant Program, Waste Management has been awarded $267,996 and this grant expires September 30th, 2024. <coughs> 2020 and 2021 grant funding. It supports the purchase of specialty equipment and training Waste Management Engineering is currently preparing scope of work and cost estimate for submission to our procurement department for a request for price quotation. The scope of work and, and cost estimate will be completed on or for the end of this month by August 31st, 2022. Uh, US EPA Clean Water State Revolving Fund, the US Environmental Protection Agency through the Department of uh, Public Works and Department of Planning and Natural Resources provides funding to the states and territory for the construction of public wastewater treatment projects. These projects, which constitute a significant contribution to the nation's water infrastructure, include sewage treatment plants, pump, pumping stations, collection and intercept sewers, rehabilitation of sewage systems, and the control of combined sewer overflows. The waste management has received funding for fiscal year 2011 through 2022, totaling $37,316,658 for pump station upgrades, sewer line repairs, wastewater treatment plant upgrades, and specialty equipment. Current waste management, clean water, state revolving fund major projects are waste management has issued notice to proceed to contractor Marco St. Croix for the Christiansted sewer line rehabilitation. This project funding covers several fiscal years, 2014 through 2018, and has an estimated budget of $11,204,755.20. Waste Management received approval of final plans and design from DPNR for the Cross Lagoon Wastewater Treatment Plant Interceptor. This project funding covers fiscal years 2013, 2014, 2016, and 2017, and has an estimated budget of $4,962,868. Major Projects Funding Plan, Mangrove Wastewater Treatment Plant, Intended use of the funding is to upgrade phases three, four, five, and six of the treatment plant. This project has an estimated budget of $3,311,650. Anna's retreat collection system, intended use of the funding is to rehabilitate and upgrade the sewer line and manholes. And this project has an estimated budget of $10,613,884.80. Small projects funding, airport force main rehabilitation and relocation Intended use of the funding is to rehabil re rehabilitate the sewer line. This project has an estimated budget of $800,000. The George Simmons Wastewater Treatment Plant intended use of the funding to upgrade the facility. Um, that project has an estimated budget of $385,500. Brassview Wastewater Treatment Plant intended use of the funding is to finalize the remaining upgrade to the treatment plant. And the remaining project balance is $121,556. Chinaman Hill sewer line replacement intent use of the funding is to replace and rehabilitate sewer lines. This project has an estimated budget of 400,000. Equipment purchase intended use of the funding is to purchase four generators for pump stations, 
The remaining project balance is $176,743.07. The Southwest Interceptor project is 100% completed. Project remaining balance is $91,178.80. And the final invoice of $82,149.80 is pending on, uh, for contract approval. For contract approval. Uh, American Resource, excuse me, American Rescue Plan Act. President Biden's rescue plan through the VI Office of Management and Budget provided funding under clean water, centralized wastewater collection and conveyance in the amount of $19 million. Waste management has selected 17 wastewater projects. These projects were chosen based on the essential need to keep the wastewater system operating. These projects will enable the authority to continue to provide necessary wastewater collection and treatment. Most of the projects are in the St. Thomas, St. John District due to the expected funds and infrastructure upgrade plan for St. Croix via prudent replacement. The listed pump stations and treatment plants need the selected bare minimum repairs to maintain the authority's ability to serve the public daily. Waste management is awaiting ARPA funding project approval from OMB. The Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority proposed projects are um, Lagoon Street Pump Station Maintenance, LBJ Pump Station Maintenance, Fig Street Pump Station Maintenance, Harold G. Wastewater Treatment Plant, Concordia Pump Station Maintenance, Upper and Lower 2-2 Replacement, Mangrove Lagoon Portable Water Supply, Wastewater, uh, wastewater Machine Shop Equipment, Red Point Wastewater Treatment Plant Maintenance, Cancrine Pump Station Maintenance, Long Bay Pump Station Maintenance, Airport Pump Station Maintenance, Nader Pump Station Maintenance, Pond Mouth Pump Station Maintenance, Small Pump Stations of Maintenance, uh, Cruise Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant Maintenance, St. John Wastewater Specialty Equipment. Wastewater User Fees. The authority has continued its work on revenue generation efforts from wastewater collection and disposal operations to increase annual funding, improve fiscal position, and gradually shift operations to self-sufficiency. A memorandum of understanding has been drafted uh, last month, July of 2022, between the authority and the Lieutenant Governor's Office delineating the responsibilities of both organizations. The authority will provide a spreadsheet with the pertinent taxpayers' information to the LGO so that the appropriate environmental user fee can be assessed against the property tax of those users of the system for the upcoming tax year. We are also collaborating with the Tax Assessor's Office to identify and collect outstanding fees, which will help us to operate and maintain our antiquated wastewater collection system. And also in an effort to generate additional revenue on the wastewater side, a wastewater septage disposal fee will be assessed to permitted septage waste haulers who deliver septage to the authorities' septage receiving facilities, which is going to be similar to the tipping fees. <coughs> procurement Division. The Procurement and Property Division continues to make necessary updates to the Policies and Procedures Manual to ensure compliance with updated federal requirements as multiple funding sources across various projects become available. Once finalized, these updates will be taken to the Board of Directors for approval and ratification. It is the goal of the, of the Procurement and Property Division to enforce the authority's policies and procedures while assisting in meeting the needs of each department, the goals of the authority, and the larger Virgin Islands community. The Procurement Division supports multiple areas to include addressing the needs for successful operations at the Bavonia and Anguilla landfills, the Susannaburg Transfer Station, current and future convenience centers, administrative facilities, along with the bin sites across the territory. The support includes collaborating with the authorities of various departments in developing currently advertised and pending solicitations for work to be completed by the solid waste, wastewater, and engineering departments, among others. The authority is currently advertising bids for hurricane repairs to Brassview Wastewater Treatment Plant on St. Thomas, George Simmons Wastewater Treatment Plant Replacement and Collection Facility Repairs on St. John, and use oil collection and transportation territory-wide, including Water Island, to name a few. All solicitation packages that prospective vendors may wish to respond to are advertised on and can be downloaded via the waste management website at www.viwma.org under the property, excuse me, under the procurement and property division tab. In addition to improving the solicitation process of current and future projects, the procurement, the procurement and property division is working to address those contracts that have expired, but where service continued to be rendered. A schedule has been developed to address the work associated with those contracts, more specifically the following, management and operation of the, of the Bavonian and Gula landfills, St. Thomas and St. Croix, operations of Peter Russ Convenience Center on St. Croix, collection services, curbside house to house, St. Thomas and St. Croix, and roll off services, St. Thomas and St. Croix. 
preparation of these scopes of work are being finalized and solicitations will be advertised in October of 2022. New contracts will be established, reviewed for legal sufficiency, and are intended to go into effect by January 2023. Strict guidelines are also currently being formalized and established to prevent the recurrence of receiving services with an expired contract for any future work the authority, the authority may engage in. Finally, in addition to the above mentioned services, the procurement and property department continues to migrate all previous solicitations from 2012 to 2000 through 2021 from paper documentation to our online SharePoint platform. This effort will allow for streamlined collection, review for auditing purposes, and prevent any loss of documentation in the event of a natural disaster. In addition, the authority is currently updating its existing procurement policy to ensure that solicitations are in line with applicable federal and local laws. Environmental Enforcement and Compliance. <clears throat> in June of this year, the authority hired four new inspectors for the territory. Four new vehicles uh, were purchased for these inspectors. A total of 15 applicants were interviewed in July for enforcement and inspector positions. We'll be hiring seven additional police officers and two additional inspectors in the next month. This will bring the total manpower to 16. Uh, officers will be responsible for writing all police reports pertaining to the waste management, pertaining to waste management, bin site inspections and sanit Bin site inspection and citations have increased dramatically. 50 citations have been issued to individuals territory-wide since February 22. And over 300 waste hauler permits have been issued territory-wide and all permitted waste haulers are up to date with their payments. Facilities. The lease at the St. Tom, <coughs> excuse me, the lease at the St. Thomas Demerara location has expired and the authority is operating on a month-to-month -month basis. This location sustained damages from Hurricanes Irma and Maria, and while our best efforts were made to clean up the property, there remains, there remains a mold issue in the trailers. Consequently, the authority has diligently, has diligently been looking for a new office space. Thus far, we've been successful in entering into a lease agreement with Bavoni Business Center, LLC, more commonly known as the Lima Building, for a bay measuring 1,200 square feet and three 540 square feet offices, uh, of square foot office spaces. The property owners indicated that additional spaces will become available within the next 60 days, and we're interested in acquiring another bay and three more offices. This additional space will allow for the expansion of our workforce. The total monthly rent for the Lima building is significantly less than Demerara, so the authority will realize the monthly savings as well. Our facilities team is currently building out the Lima offices, and we hope to have them completed by the end of the year. We do not plan to stay at Lima for more than five years. And in the interim, we will be repairing the third floor of the Mangrove building and bringing in the service and gas recovery building at the Bavoni landfill. Once these renovations have been accomplished, the authority will own our offices outright as we do on St. Croix. Ideally, our long-term plan is to reconfigure the landfill by cleaning up the entrance so that we can have office spaces in a clean environment while shifting the area for the trash disposal and, and debris. On the island of St. Croix, the authority plans to rehabilitate the second floor of the Estate Glen building to provide additional space for current and future staff this, that, that will be needed to assist with the wastewater permit replacement program. On the island of St. John, the mold-infested, dilapidated office at Susannaburg was replaced with three new container offices. This new efficient build-out includes two bathrooms, an office for the St. John Solid Waste Manager, one for the sanitation techs, with built-in capacity to facilitate the collection of tipping fees, an office for the environmental enforcement inspectors, and one for rotating staff members working on St. John. IT projects. The IT division manages the authority's network infrastructure while providing technical support to divisions working on various projects. During the current fiscal year, the IT division has conducted the following upgrades to the authority's network infrastructure. Deploy three new servers to the authority's cloud space. The servers are being used to house the finance division's accounting software and database. Expanded the authority's WAN to the Angola landfill. This expansion has given the staff at Angola access to all the authority's network resources and inner office telephone service. Angola is in the final stage of this expansion. Uh, install internet access to all the territory's pump stations. This is allowed for the use of telemetry at the pump stations by our wastewater division. Uh, to assist the solid waste, in, okay, yeah, to assist the solid waste and environmental enforcement division to combat illegal dumping, the IT division has installed surveillance cameras to the following bin sites: Nazareth, Black Black Point, Cotton Valley, Brookman, Belongo, Mambiju, Carrot Bay, Gift Hill, Concordia, 
Hand Crying, and Coral Bay. The Soloway staff at both landfills and the St. John Transfer Station received new hardware and software upgrades in preparation for the collection of tipping fees. And also to ensure operational efficiency, the IT division has begun installing GPS tracking in the authority's vehicles in coordination with fleet management software to ensure safe operation and regularly scheduled maintenance of all vehicles. Personnel. With allowable funds, the authority intends to fulfill its mandate and, and ex expand upon and uh, expound on its future goals to ensure there's adequate staffing levels to sustain public safety and health. Using anticipated revenues, grants, and other sources, the organization will continue to recruit, train, develop, and retain a diverse workforce. The Waste Management Authority currently has 141 committed and diligent employees with 79 in the St. Thomas, St. John District and 62 in the St. Croix District. Despite the pandemic in fiscal year 22, we were able to hire an, an additional 33 employees and internally promote 10 employees. The authority's constant goal is to review job descriptions, salaries, collective bargaining agreements, uh, employee govern, em, em, collective bargaining agreements, employee government policies, procedures, and training programs. Currently, we are in the middle of bargaining agreement discussions and hope to conclude before the beginning of the new fiscal year. During the past year, numerous employee engagement activities have been executed to increase morale. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge the employees of the year for the St. Thomas St. John District, Mr. Elvis George, and the employee for the year employee of the year for the St. Croix District, Mr. Dale Fergus, and again wish them congratulations and thank them for service to the authority. Additionally, I would like to thank all the employees for their support and dedication to the authority's vision. Their hard work makes me proud and and, and actually makes my job a little easier. <clears throat> Health and safety. The health and safety of the employees at the Waste Management Authority remains a top priority. Under the Environmental Health and Safety Division, a safety program has been developed in line with the authority's day-to-day -day occupational safety regulations, encompassing the operational emergency management roles and responsibilities. Safety committee meetings and all weekly, all weekly staff safety meetings provide venues for employees and management to work collaboratively while providing solutions to health and safety concerns within the authority. The development and implementation of a training matrix ensures that all employees are provided with the necessary safety and health training mandated by OSHA and local laws. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to protect employees and contractors while maintaining con continuity of operations, the authority, the authority established an internal COVID team comprised of members from senior leadership, human resources, and health and safety divisions. Now, together, decisions are made to address the ever-changing response to COVID-19 based on guidance from the VI Department of Health and the Centers, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to include, but not limited to, providing telework options, conducting virtual meetings, issuing personal protective equipment, mandating social distancing, and frequent sanitization of facilities. Uh, waste management and biobot analytics COVID-19 detection initiatives uh, is continuing. In February 2021, Waste Management partnered with BioBot Analytics, a wastewater global leader in wastewater epidemiology, to track COVID-19's presence on a broader level in the territory in a non-invasive, anonymous way. BioBot uses the data present in wastewater to learn valuable insights that shape the health of communities. Uh, headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, BioBot collaborates with governments and municipalities nationwide. Waste Management has been testing at five of our wastewater facilities weekly throughout the territory. We received we, we received weekly community reports which detail how the islands compare as far as detected caseload. Our work with BioBot serves as an as an additional tool to assist the Department of Health monitor the territory's progress as re, in, in regards to the virus. Waste management regularly tests the the wastewater that is treated by our facilities in compliance with our territory pollution discharge elimination system permit. The USVI was selected and participate in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. National Disease Surveillance Program led by Biobot Analytics. This 12-week program in May of 2021 where um, Health and Human Services collected and analyzed samples from 320 wastewater treatment plants covering 100 million people across 50 states and territories to gather, on, to gather data on the presence of COVID-19. Testing at our wastewater treatment plant, plants is continuing on a weekly basis beginning Early this fall, our collaboration with BioBot will include testing for the monkeypox virus. And all the territory's data from our last 18 months of testing can be found at www.biobot.io. <coughs> key accomplishments. Hiring of key positions, hire, hiring of key positions in the organization. We hired a chief financial officer, 
uh, chief legal officer and chief planning officer. Uh, we've assigned employees to high demand bin sites, currently three uh, St. Thomas sites, uh, the Red Hook, Belongo, and Cancrine. So we've assigned employees to that as we transition from unmanned bin sites to convenience centers. Uh, telemetry, um, pump stations, <clears throat> telemetry at, our, at all of our pump stations, that, that's a highly automated communications process that sends notifications for potential noncompliance issues per consent decree that's been completed. Um, we enhance our pump stations by, we added resiliency by purchasing pumps and making repairs to, all, to pump stations. We've updated the wastewater operation and maintenance plan to include daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly plans to maintain the wastewater system in compliance with the Clean Water Act and the TPDES permit. Uh, we purchased critical vehicles, both you know light duty and heavy duty, to help support day-to-day -day operations and to support specialized collection and maintenance duties on uh, both the solid waste and wastewater uh, and waste, solid waste and wastewater operations. Uh, the tipping fee was approved, um, and we actually were able to implement that in January 2022. Um, as I mentioned, Bob bought wastewater testing, collaborating with Department of Health to continue providing COVID-19 data, um, and also we'll start um, testing for monkeypox in the fall. Uh, we've have, we have restructured and enhanced emergency management plans and processes to, to prepare the authority for any potential future catastrophic events. We implemented the following cost savings measures too. Um, utilizing the Resmar foam, which is an alternate daily cover instead of dirt, to assist with landfill air spacing for the control of dust, odors, and volatile organic compounds to safely address operational concerns at the Angola landfill on St. Croix. Uh, that's about a $100,000 a month savings. Um, this alternate daily cover and the approved USDA wildlife mitigation plan has allowed the authority to place trash directly into the landfill's working face and to cease using the transfer station, which is another $200,000 a month savings. <clears throat> we re re revisited security contracts for all waste management facilities, um, which is a $10,000 a month savings. We revisited contract that we re re excuse me. We revisited the contract for solid waste bin site collection on St. John, um, that resulted in $75,000 a month savings from the previous contractor. Uh, In-house collections um, for St. Thomas bin sites, Thomasville, Nader, Belongo, and Brookman uh, has resulted in approximately $40,000 a month savings. In-house collection for the St. John reloader bin sites has resulted in approximately $25,000 a month savings. So the total of those overall savings is approximately $5.4 million annually. As far as challenges, you know, while the authorities made great strides over the last year, some challenges remain, including you know, we still have an aging facility and uh, infrastructure, waste management, wastewater infrastructure is over 50 years old, and most of the system has outlived its useful life. Now, FEMA's approved prudent replacement for St. Croix and future approval for St. Thomas St. John will address this eventually. Uh, aging fleet and lack of equipment, um, insufficient budget appropriations to cover basic operational costs. Uh, waste management submitted a supplemental budget to OMB for an additional $24 million per year based on a thorough review of our solid waste and wastewater operations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the true annual cost to operate the authority is approximately $60 million. Uh, in summary, while the uh, myriad, myriad of challenges plaguing the authority continues to present day-to-day -day reactive measures and emergency situations, the goal of the authority and my team has been to always move towards a more proactive maintenance-based methodology regarding operations. However, we must have the appropriate funding available to support this vision. Um, the grants and other available funding sources we discussed will and have assisted with improvements, and, we, and we've taken the necessary steps to, towards the goal of self-sufficiency by charging solid waste fees, and a plan for proposed wastewater fees will be submitted to the PSC in this fiscal year so the authority can continue creating additional revenue streams. Um, you know, I close by sincerely thanking the hardworking staff of the Waste Management Authority for their dedication and commitment to not only their day-to-day -day jobs, but in, but in supporting the future vision of the authority. I'd also like to thank the Brian Roach administration and the members of the 34th legislature for their support as we continue to address solid waste and wastewater issues. This concludes my testimony, and my team and I remain available to address any questions relative to this update. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, colleagues. We're going to go directly into a six-minute <coughs> round. Welcome, Senator Frankie Johnson. Welcome. Senator Noble Francis. Senator Blyden, six minutes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. 
Director Merritt and your supporting management team there with you. And thank you so much for that most comprehensive testimony. <coughs> and you, spoke, you spoke to the important role that waste management plays in our community and um, basically folks not realizing how important of a role that the agency plays until or unless there's sewage running on the street or there's garbage piling over. And, and that's, a, that's a true um, perspective of what we see around here. But nonetheless, um, let me ask in respect to your budget. You spoke to um, uh, basically onboarding 33 individuals in 23 um, budget cycle, and also you, prom uh, you promoted 10 from within. How much new positions do you have at the agency um, in a 23 budget, and how many vacancies do you have still left in a 23 budget? Let me let me defer to our, our HR director, Ms. Callwood, to answer that question. Hi, HR director. Um, you asked how many new in the budget? I believe 23 budget, yeah. yeah. It's 40, I believe. And vacant positions? About 71. Wow. To total, sorry, 71 total, 40, and that would be 29. 31. Okay. Um, because based on um, Director Merit, Merit um, statement, and you guys have a, a serious role to play, and in his testimony mentioned <laughs> over $100 million in different um, funding sources that's going to help to basically upgrade the whole system from, this, from the sewage to the treatment plant, to solid waste. And, and um, I, I believe um, that uh, you guys have a lot to do in terms of fulfilling your roles. But at the end of the day, it will be um, in the best interest of the territory as we move forward um, in the future with a whole new system in place because of these hundreds of millions of dollars in federal um, grants and funds and um, revenue that's coming in. And that's a good thing. And it's, it's critical that you. Um, you know, utilize those funds appropriately and make sure we spend every penny. Let me ask, though, because also when it comes to um, the way spending authority, you spoke to um, the hall of the contractors who usually do most of the work um, and the, the challenges you have in terms of um, keeping up with the payments. I know you spoke in your testimony to some $28 million that's owed to the those um, contractors, and I know in looking at the post, other reports, I saw $10 million for Marco and $11 million for um, A9. Those are the two that stuck out to me. Um, what is being done in the interim to see how you can assist those individuals? Um, I know you spoke to also funds that the governor and, on the, and this body appropriated, but what are we doing in terms of the relationship, the communication with those individuals? Yeah, we, we, we have continual, <clears throat> excuse me, we continue, you know, we continually talk to those contractors uh, regarding their the uh, outstanding uh, amounts that are owed to them um, the the 14 million dollar um, payment that we that I referenced in the testimony that was a part of the payment to basically make them whole you know we we, we spoke with each one of the contractors determined um, what the amounts that were owed and now now we, we, we have that understanding and now we're just trying to make sure we, we address that and that's one of the reasons why I, I um, mentioned in the testimony that a $28 million uh, one-time appropriation will allow us to basically, you know, break even, pay up, pay, pay those contractors, Marco and SDNC, uh, A9 and other contractors, and then, you know, everybody will be, um, uh, have, would have been compensated for all the hard work they did for us from 2017 to 2022, you know, you know, during the hurricanes and after. Okay, very well. In addition to that. Two minutes. Um, you just, you know, two minutes, well, you just mentioned about a hurricane. There was another contractor from the St. Thomas, St. John District, mainly worked in uh, Susanna Borg. I know you have some issues. Have you resolved those issues with that contractor? So, okay. St. please. Yeah, those, uh, if, uh, I think I know which contractor you're referring to, and I think if it's the one that we're, that I, that I think you're referring to, we're, uh, that's a that's a, a pending legal matter, so we're still? trying to finalize that. Yes, it's still. So, no, no movement? I'm sorry, what? No movement on that? Uh, no, there's 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 been movement. It's just that the the discussions are ongoing. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll come to a resolu resolution here. Uh, hopefully, before the end of this year. Thank you for that. And also, you spoke to um, A and E Design 
for St. Croix. 30 million dollars that was awarded. Um, and that's that's good news. Um, are there anything that works for the St. Thomas St. John district also? Well, so, so yeah, so on the on on prudent replacement, we've submitted information to FEMA to try and get the basically the similar approval for St. Thomas and St. John, and that's that information has been submitted. Hopefully, we'll get uh, some kind of approval before the end of this year, but we're hope you know, we're we're expecting to get approval for prudent replacement and you know, somewhere along the lines of a little bit, you know, we got two point one billion for St. Croix, so we're expecting something in that same in that in that same uh, neighborhood for St. Thomas St. John. That, Pro most likely a little thank bit you more. For that. Thank you for that. And the EPA grants. I know you see some thirty seven point three million dollars, but you have a balance of thirty two million dollars. When does those grant expire and do you see um, the, the agency anticipate of using all those federal, those funds to assure that, you know, the intended purpose and use for those grants are administered? Yeah, we don't, we don't, <laughs> we do not plan on leaving any money that any federal agency gives us. We will not, we, we don't plan on not spending it. <laughs> We're definitely going to spend every, everything that we have because it's going to only help the authority move forward and, and help us with, uh, you know, operations on both, like I said, the solid waste and the wastewater side. Time. To Eric. But my time is up. Oh my God, Mr. Chair, can I conclude, please? Um, the, yes, the consent decree. The consent decree. I know you've been in court many times. You've been working hard on that thing. You said anticipate um, 2027, and we're going to have a saving of 3.5 million dollars. Um, I, I, let me ask quickly um, in, in respect to that. Uh, so you show you, you see us for sure coming out of that by 27. Yeah. So. As far as the, the wastewater consent decree, that was entered into 20, basically in 2000. Well, the consent decree was before um, 2007, but operating those, uh, part, as part of the consent decree, operating those uh, wastewater treatment plants began in 2007. 20-year contract ends in 2027. Um, as I mentioned in our testimony, we, we already have identified some staff. We're putting together a training program with Veolia um, so that we can get our Get our tra uh, get our staff uh, trained and get them up to speed. You know, because it's 2022 now, 2027. Even though it's five years from now, that's going to come relatively quickly. So, trying to make sure we have our staff ready. Um, so we're starting at five years before. And you say you collected um, a million dollars as of today's date since January. What's the anticipation by the um, end of the fiscal year in tipping fees? And, and that should be it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Senator Blyden. You may respond. So by the end of the, I mean, we, I'd say probably, I mean, we're right at, uh, so from January to now, we're right at $971,000. So, you know, so on average, it's about $100,000, $125,000 a month. So if you go, if you're saying end of fiscal year or end of calendar year, which? Calendar. Calendar year. So so August, September, October, November, December. So another six hundred and. um Another what seven hundred thousand? Oh, well, no, sorry, Thanks, another, another another six hundred twenty-five thousand. Let me do my quick math. Another six hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, so that would mean that in total for the year, if we're at um, nine seventy plus six plus six twenty-five, then you're talking right at roughly one point six for the year. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, page eleven of twenty-three with a professional service contract listing. Are those numbers updated or they need to be updated? Because I know you recently, um, after the work stoppage on St. Croix, some monies were paid. So are these updated numbers or they need to be updated? Griffin? They're updated. They're updated. Okay. I also want to put on the record that we did try to advance some $15 million to the Waste Management Authority. The monies were included in the supplemental budget that was sent uh, to Government House. It was not. The veto message said that we didn't have those monies in the septage account, the septage from septage fee. It, it wasn't from that. We were increasing the Waste Management budget by that $15 million to make those outstanding payments because we know that Presently, within this fiscal year budget, we have way more than $15 million and we could have been able to, to pay down and these outstanding debts so that we don't owe these individuals from 2017. And um, shortly, we will have a meeting where it will show that the monies are there. 
and, and there's more than sufficient funding um, to pay um, that particular or other waste haulers and also um, your solid waste, not solid waste, um, waste water uh, that we have owed for a number of years. So I will be moving for override and a line item, and I hope that my colleagues um, support me in that endeavor so we can get these monies paid. Senator DeGraff, you Thank recognize. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers, all of you and listening and present. Um, Director Merrick, I, I'm looking at a post auditor's report <clears throat> from 23 and 24, I mean 23 and 22. You you lost $6 million? What is your, your final recommendation? Um, you just talking about from the uh, from funding from from uh, the post auditor's report <coughs> on page 14 of 23, it says uh, total funding the general fund and the other funds 36 million three hundred thousand. That's that's your total. Yes. Because for the 22 budget, the total was 42 million three hundred thousand. So you lost six million dollars. Correct. So well, thank you for thank you for mentioning that. So the analytical <laughs> beautification fund um, is four, is five million dollars, and so we, right. you know, so we don't have that. And then the and Saint the John, John Capital improvement. improvement Fund was a million dollars. So you are you are correct. Right, six million dollars, cheese and bread. That's that that's a hard spot to even start with to move any further from here. Um, also notice with your vehicles. You went from, I think as on page eight of the uh, post auditor's report, you went from 200 and something vehicles to 30 something vehicles? No, I think, uh, let me see if I got the numbers right. How much vehicles do you have now? I don't know the, the exact number. Off the uh, top. Page eight. You had uh, 67, 67 vehicles. 67 vehicles. 67 vehicles. Okay, and I think you had um, 90 something. How many vehicles did you have last fiscal year? They were showing, I'm trying to bring it up one time. They're showing um, 94 vehicles. In the 22 budget, they're showing 94 vehicles. And the 23 budget, they're showing 67 vehicles. Is that correct? Um, uh, those numbers aren't exactly correct, but what we did was last year we had a um, we we auctioned some of the vehicles. So you know you you see the the excellent, very good, good, fair, very poor. We had a lot of vehicles that were very poor, <laughs> poor or very in, uh, poor and very poor condition. So we were able to auction some of those off uh, and use some of the money to, uh, to to purchase some additional vehicles. That that's like a third of your fleet gone. Yeah, well, well uh, actually a third of the fleet wasn't even operational because. They were in such poor condition. So six million dollars gone, a third of your fleet gone. <clears throat> um, the I think personal and fringe went from ten million to eleven million. I think a different of one point five million. I believe it. I believe it increased. I think that that increases for what? <clears throat> wage, wage increases? Yeah. Well, it's, it increased. Well, we've we've um, as I mentioned in the testimony, we hired additional staff. There was there was some. We had a. Uh, Last year, we had um, an increase from our uh, on our solid waste and our wastewater staff um, in working with in working with them and different. Um, uh, well, I, you know, I guess I can let. Um, Wait, you, you, you had a contractual agreement wage increase? Did you have that? Uh, we're actually working. You're yeah. working in it now. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. And you hired ten people, I think you say, or promoted ten people inside. Correct. Then. <clears throat> You're going from 10 million to 11 million in personnel and fringe, but you're losing six million dollars. That's that's that. So I'm I'm glad that you're bringing all that up. So at the end, when I said we've uh, from a waste management standpoint and what we've done in house to to create you know additional savings and cost savings, where we've 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 internally been able to come up with about five million dollars in savings by by changing our changing our operations. I mean, so we're the authority, we're doing our part to try and figure out ways to continue providing our solid waste and wastewater collection services as, as most, uh, you know, efficiently and effectively as possible. But when we do have um, appropriations and they, the numbers change, that doesn't, that definitely doesn't help us. Two so minutes. We are, okay. we are continuing to, 
you know, we have to provide these services. We know that because it, 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 it impacts the lives, daily lives of our Virgin Islanders. So we're doing our part. We definitely, any assistance that the legislature can can provide to us to to make sure that the the money appropriated for us is there so that we can actually continue our Are you up to date with GRS payments? I believe we're... Any, any outstanding yeah, GRS? Yeah, we're, we're, we're up to date on up GRS date payments, yes. Okay, so... Um, and how much you generate in revenue to date? Current well, total if, revenue. If you if you add so we the tipping fees we just that was our our first major revenue generating thing. So if you say we're going to get about one point six million dollars by the end of this year, um, and I think the other the the what, the, the, the permits mm -hmm. and e waste special waste disposal e waste disposal I don't think that even accounts for like a couple hundred thousand dollars. So even if you say it's four hundred thousand. The, you know, we generate no more than $2 million a year. Now, the tipping fee is going to go up every year for the next four years. So we're going to, that, that revenue is going to continue to increase. We're going to go to the, like I mentioned in the testimony, we're going to go to the, on the wastewater side of the house now, and all the, the septage, all the septage haulers, they come into our facilities for free, kind of like what the, the trash haulers did with the landfills. So we're going to go to the PSC and do the very similar things, submit something to, to uh, actually charge them a fee. So we'll get a wastewater fee, um, but even if it's even if you say it's the same as the as the solid waste fee, let's say hypothetically, and we get another million, two million dollars, we're still going to be at four or five million dollars of a what what we really need. You know what I'm saying? So, what we really need going forward. So what 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 funds do you use to pay? Vendors or to pay waste haulers, what 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 monies do you use to pay those on, so, on a regular? Even if you have to pay them some, so what, what funds do you use? So what we do is like all the whatever, Time. yeah. The, so we the the lot. So let's say we have the thirty six point three million right now, right? We're going to use as much of that as we can to pay pay haulers. But we have to pay staff. We as, that's why I mentioned all that in the testimony because I think everyone needs to understand how you know this you know. Even if we get the one-time appropriation, let's say you, you give us the appropriation, that's going to help us. We're going to have everyone paid. But then we're going to start the same cycle over again because we're underfunded. So we're at $36 million and the true cost to operate the authority is 60 By the end of this year, we're going to be right back where we started. That's why we need, we need assistance. I mean, now, and we're doing our part by making sure that we are looking at ways we can save money and do things differently and more effectively. And that's why, that's why I wanted to mention the $5 million of, of savings that we have literally, you know, looked at our internal operations and done. Now we're collecting revenue on the, on the, on the solid waste side. We're going to go after revenue on the wastewater side, we, but we still, need this, this, we still need help. Okay, so in closing, if I may, Mr. Chair, just, just to, to close, you're in negotiation now. What estimated among the monies are you looking at to have to pay out if you can estimate for wage increases that you will need added to the budget? Because again, you'll have to do a supplemental anyhow. So thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Go answer the chair's okay. side, please. Sure. Thank um, you, Senator DeGraff. You, you may answer. You, you're literally saying your yeah. cost of operating is 60 million, and you're only getting 36. Yeah, yeah, we we can pro we can provide that. We didn't we have the numbers for the staff and everything, but we, we can provide Thank that you. to you. So we we literally <laughs> entering into all of these contracts knowing that we don't have the money to pay it. Um, I would not that we're entering into contracts with not knowing that we can play, we can pay what we what we're, what we're well, saying is that it's even worse we we don't have contracts for companies that are doing business but we don't have the money to pay them yeah that's so over the last 2 years what I've of the the last 2 fiscal years and I um submitted a supplemental budget to OMB <coughs> excuse me so initially you know our general fund allotment was 25 million so I submitted so when I when I when I arrived here in twenty in August of twenty twenty for the uh, for the submittal for twenty one, I submitted the supplemental budget showing what the true costs were to operate the authority. And I think that along with uh, with the legislative with with the legislative uh, assistance, I think you guys helped increase the the funding of yes. the general fund from twenty five million to thirty five million. Um, but my, and my thought was, well, hey, we're going to continue. 
um, you know, being more efficient operationally and seeing ways where we can save money. And then we're going to basically resubmit the supplemental budget again to show you, hey, look, here's our cost savings. So when I submitted that, I said it was we needed 29 million, and so I, I, we resubmitted and said we really need now we need 24 million because we've saved we've saved some money, but we need we still need help. Um, but then, as Senator DeGraff just mentioned, then X amount of money was it went from it was going to be 32.3 million, and then when um, we got the 10 million dollar appropriation, it was with the 10 million dollars increase from the general fund to, from 25 to 35. If we had that along with our other St. John capital improvement and also the analytical beautification, we'd have been at 42.3 along with my savings. So we were getting there, getting there, and then uh, some things got, you know, for, for whatever reason, some appropriations. Um, yeah, I will come back to that type of discussion on the analytical beautification, but some senators okay. um, have to travel, so I'm going to allow them to speak. Senator Saro, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Good afternoon. Um, quickly, Mr. Director Merritt, the old post that it had you at one salary and you have a salary increase. That was, the board approved that? I'm sorry, what was your, what was your question? Your salary. The board no. approved your salary increase? Yes. Okay. Because the, the post that it has a $10,000 difference between two, the both. Yes. Okay. Legal counsel. <coughs> um, so you've retained in-house in legal counsel, correct? Correct. The old post that it had you paying legal counsel outside some roughly 10k retainer now that you have in-house competent in-house legal counsel do you still have a legal counsel and retainer for 10k so we still have legal counsel the the amount has changed what we're doing what is, is the amount yeah but um i don't i don't see it in the new post audit report we just hired the well so the the we hired legal counsel in march and so it wouldn't have been in the okay so the outside month. legal counsel i don't know who that is. It, it, it wasn't listed um, the, the company, but with outside legal counsel at 10K per month, you still don't have contracts executed? You still on this invoice system? No, no, what, what we're doing, so, and I, I can, I'll let our- Sister, you have a lot our, of questions. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no problem. I'll let, our, I'll let our CFO answer part of this too. Where are we on contracts? Go ahead. Yeah. Right now, what, what we're doing is <coughs> act actively, um, advertising for contracts, and our plan is to have all of our contracts uh, in place by the end of the f 2023 let me, fiscal year. Let me talk to legal counsel. Can we get a timeline on contracts? We cannot afford the, the current system. We simply can't afford it. So we can get some contracts executed? Yes, they're all lined up. They are lined up? Yes. OK, come back to harass you in six months. Exactly. OK, good. <laughs> now, let's, um, let's move to these vehicles that you purchased. I see a lot of new vehicles because it says no plate, so clearly they're new. Um, how many vehicles? I seen a lot of Tacomas and what's not. What 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 was the total you spent on the vehicles? What's the amount? That ain't excellent. Time, my time, my time. Yeah. No. I, well, the the post audit says is is. It's 24 vehicles. We, but that that includes all the that includes other vehicles that we. I'm not have. talking about the truck or the things that you need. The Tacomas and everything else, the Jeep Wranglers. How many vehicles did you purchase? Uh, to the tune of what? I'd say to the tune of. Oh, sorry. I would say, for both the wastewater side and the solid waste side, we've purchased a, the, to the tune of probably maybe five six hundred thousand dollars in vehicles. Okay. So, um, did any go to enforcement? I mean, to yeah, your officers? So four, yeah, four went, to, four went to enforcement. Well, you have three I'm enforcement sorry, I'm officers. Sorry, four went, Come no, on. No, no, in my testimony, the environmental inspectors got four. The three officers have, they, they, have, uh, they have vehicles. Have you seen their vehicles? No. Well, 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 one minute. Please mention your name because we have a no recorder. But wait, before you speak, why don't you ask your question before you speak, just mention your name. Okay, sorry. Uh, Director Merritt. So the, 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 the uh, environmental inspectors got four new vehicles. We are, also, we are in the process of uh, trying to purchase new vehicles for our enforcement why officers. Did not, why didn't you not include that in the list of vehicles purchased? Can inspectors give a cita citation? No, they can't. Okay, who gives your citations? Our officers. That's where you generate your revenue, right? Correct. So your revenue component of waste management should be equipped to do what they need to do. So why weren't they included in that number? They, they're, they're included in that number. What, what happened is that we're trying to get... So, so the the uh, enforcement vehicles, they, they're be. Um, Hold on a second, Mr. Merritt. Did the board approve these purchases? 
Yes. They did? Yes. Okay. Retroactively or, or ahead of time? Mm, ahead of time. We, yeah, I, I could let our CFO okay. uh, discuss that. No, because you're giving but, me an answer about <coughs> these vehicles. And really, you, you're wasting my time not to, be, not to try to be adversarial. But, you know, you're giving me a long story about not providing the revenue component of your agency with vehicles. Now, let's, let's, let's go to... Um, let, can let's I, go. Can I, let me Hold a sec. So okay. I'm looking at your salaries, right? I'm a little bothered by your salaries. If you see my sticky notes here. Um, when I say bothered, there's a big gap between the top leadership and the workmen. And I asked you about this employee already, Director of Special Projects. I see a whole promotion here. And you, I asked you for his credentials. Does that person have a degree? Yeah, that, that, yeah, remember when we had to discuss that person. And you told me that you were going to give me the information and you never gave it to okay, me. Okay, I can get that information to you. Okay, so could this person, we move to special projects and strategic what? Special projects and strategic initiative. What is, what is that? For 100,682. 100, yeah, so, so, so the Waste Management Authority... On um, you think about it on the solid waste side and the wastewater side. Two minutes. We have a variety of things that we have to work on. Uh, issues associated with our consent decrees on both on both sides. Um, issues associated with facilities. I mean. Um, Hold a second. Consent decrees more legal. Would not be your legal team. Yeah, I mean, so it's so it's a combination. There's actually when you when you. you know think that's my concern. We create positions for people. That's my concern. I don't know based on all these positions that you have. And what you're outlining to me, you have a whole facilities director. You have, um, you have a, a, a chief administrative officer. I don't know what that is. You have all these positions at these high salaries. And up to <coughs> now, I'm asking you, what's the credentials for this employee? Because I really don't know. When you see special projects and strategic something, we really just create the position. And I, I, because I, what you're outlining to me, you already have listed positions for this. Let's move quickly. I'm seeing your environmental enforcement director. Does that person have a degree? From a. You, Somebody. I'm sorry. This is HR director Erica Calwood. I'd have to review the file. I can't tell okay. you exactly. I don't think that person has a degree. Environmental enforcement requires, the, especially what you do. You have a specialized, you talk about asbestos in, in sand and all of these things happening. So <coughs> that enforcement director has to have some knowledge or some, if you don't have the degree, the experience in something waste management, like, and that the person is coming straight from the PD government, how straight to you? And then you, this person is making 100K supervising three enforcement officers. Last fiscal year, I had the same discussion with you. You understand how that kills employee morale? And then when you look through these vacancy listings, you go to the grant administrator, your grant administrators make far less. And they are managing millions of federal dollars coming to waste management. And if your grant administrator does not do their job, you lose your federal funding. So we have to place some priority. This personal listing is cause for concern. And I honestly feel that we're just bumping up the top employees of waste management. Some are clearly not qualified for the positions, and you kill employee morale when you do that. You really do. Please take into consideration for the hundredth time my position and your salaries. I'm not saying people don't work their salaries, but it's unfair for somebody to go to college, come back, managing millions of federal dollars, and then you, you have a chief enforcement officer making 100K with three employees, and a created position of special projects. Really, Director Merritt? Time. Now, lastly, Mr. Chair, quickly, let's talk about your raises, you and then I'm going to go on this plain. Raises to wastewater and solid waste. I knew you gave raises. How far back did you give your raises? My time has been cut. How far back did you give the raises? For they waste? went back to October, uh, the fiscal year 2020. 2020? Yeah, October 2020. Okay, did you involve the union? Was this through OCB? No, we involved the, yeah, we, we, we involved the union. So every, and, and OCB, yes. So everybody in wastewater and solid waste received raises? It, 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 it was based on how many years they were there, they were, they had been with the authority. And there was a, there was a criteria that was set that was agreed upon with the, the union and OCB. So are there still people that need to be made whole? 
in this in this um, category. And Mr. Chai, I think you could follow up. I don't think the employees are waste water and solid waste. I think some receive funding, their <coughs> money is not all, and I think that that's going to cause some issues within the union. Thank you for the you, time. You may Mr. respond. Chair. I can address that. So let me, there's a couple things. I, if the, Go ahead and respond. The, the, uh, the enforcement vehicles, the reason why the uh, vehicles for the enforcement officers weren't placed is because there's a, there's, a, like, uh, there's a nationwide shortage on those vehicles. So it was like a seven to nine month. Um, Wait a period? To, yeah, to get them. So we, we, we're actually in the process of getting them. We just can't get them because they got to be outfitted, especially for officers. Um, wastewater. The, Wastewater. Yeah, for okay, wastewater. Uh, for the, uh, the the salaries that you're discussing, um, when the agreement that we had in place or that we made with uh, OCB and the union, um, it was for it, it, it depended on the years of service of the, for the employee. And so now, as we're going forward with this collective bargaining agreement and negotiations, now those employees, along with the ones that hadn't been with the authority as long. Are, are all included in that going forward, and we're gonna we're kind of slotting them and doing different things. That's 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 what is currently happening right now. So everybody is being addressed, and then uh, then the other question about all of our staff. I mean, we've looked at. Um, I mean, I've looked at all of our staff and making sure that everyone is 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 compensated for for what they're doing. Still working with staff. I mean, that's 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 an ongoing thing because obviously. Uh, everyone does a lot of work, and so I want to make sure that they all are that they are compensated appropriately, fairly. So I'm I'm, I'm still working on that and addressing that um, as we as we speak. Okay, thank you. The other wastewater considered hazardous. Wastewater. The hazardous designation. You know. And the reason why I ask those individuals are working in manholes, um, exposed to a lot of chemicals. <clears throat> I know the employees from, from years past, and a number of those employees had a lot of health issues from um, the exposure on a regular basis. And that was the biggest, lot, the biggest concern that I heard from the wastewater staff, that um, that hazardous duty um, designation because of the exposure to chemicals, et cetera. Has there been any consideration or any discussion? Hi, good afternoon again, HR Director. We have been discussing that with the union as long as, um, I'm sorry, as well as with GRS, because GRS has to give the final nod to the designation to ensure that everybody's included by position. Now, GRS don't have to do anything. Well, we have, in order if for them is, to be paid on. as has a duty. Now, hold sorry. on, hold on. Uh -huh. If it's designated um, that they are hazardous duty employees, then... Um, the compensation to GRS changes for those employees, mm -hmm. which would then be the responsibility of the employee on the employee side and the employer on the employer side. But GRS don't have to agree. They just have to be compensated in, in terms of, of, of those years that those employees have worked. We've been in discussion with them in agreement. We wanted them to agree if the position is designated as hazardous, the amount whether we put in the 13% or whoever would pay 11.5, whether or not. And one of the discussions we were having with the union is we were coming to an agreement on deciding which positions particularly would be included. And we had a meeting as recently as I think May or June of this year, and we're waiting to hear back from them if they agree with us so we know what percentage we should be paying on behalf of the employees. But if they are designated as hazardous duty, that would automatically mean they're gonna get an increase, right? Yes. So I think that's step one. Step two is whether or not we have the ability to retroactively do anything. But step one is just to put them on the right scale. And I mean, they, they've looked at pay scale for those similar type positions across the nation. And anybody that are working in those type of conditions um, usually get more money. It's not easy to go down in those manholes with sewage all over the place. So I think the first step is to get them on the right pay scale. And from that point, they would have to be paying um, into the system at, at the 30%. But I'm not even speaking about a retroactive discussion now going back 10, 15 years, just about getting them um, the pay that they deserve right now uh, because of the job that they're doing. One of the things we do, we do pay um, a hazard duty amount internally. We do give. What's that amount? 1500 mm -hmm. And we're revisiting, I know Edie Merritt and I had a discussion about increasing that amount, but we wanted to make sure we have cleared the designation at 
in conjunction again with GRS, make clear what percentage we would be paying. Yeah, I've, I've so in, in some of my previous jobs, the um, we had a hazardous designation for, um, let's say, people working at the landfill, and there was a certain amount that was an hourly amount that was put that was attached to their check. And so I've been talking to uh, our HR to figure out if we can do that. I mean, the fifteen hundred dollar a year amount is, you know, I, I a, a little more than a hundred dollars a month. Right. So I said, I, I said, I want to look at look at different ways to, to compensate our employees because you're, you're ab absolutely correct. It's on both the landfills, on both the solid waste side and the wastewater side, it's, it's, this is not a, uh, a glamorous job and they are put in, um, in, in dangerous situations. So I do want to make sure that they're compensated. I, I, you know, I talk to our staff all the time about the fact that what we do is, um, is, is it's important to the territory, but it also, we, we, you know, we want to make sure that our guys, it's, it's, the environment is, is such that it's, it's, it's hazardous. Okay. But, and your enforcement is, are they, um, did they receive their pay raises? Your, your small enforcement division? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Enforcement, your enforcement, <coughs> they also receive a pay increase? Um, we're supposed to be in negotiation right now. One of the things we were looking at is they're part of the collective bargain agreement with all the regular staff. We were trying to see how we can do a Separate bit of a demo. separation, yes, so that they're compensated differently because of the nature of their job. Okay. Senator Cario. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to waste management agency team. Um, and um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I saw here, in regards to your testimony, uh, that the financial division in the last five months has completed the Doherty's 2018, 2019, and 2020 audits. Uh, any findings? Yes, we did have some findings on the audits. Okay. Um, can you provide those audits through the chair to this committee? Definitely. Uh, in regards to the findings, what director is of main concern? And how many findings were identified for each, each audit? Go ahead. Um, the, the findings were about four to five findings. I don't have the audit actually in, in front of me. Uh, the, the, the major concern on four the Four to five for each year? Yes, sir. The, the major concern on, on each audit was um, basically making sure that our procurement policy is in line with the, the federal dollars that we're, that we're receiving. And, um, and, and that, that's basically the, the major concern in a nutshell is to, to, to update our, all of our policies and procedures to make sure that they're in line with the next step that waste management is taking in both funding and in services that we're providing. Because we're going from a, 15 million, a $35 million organization to a multi-billion dollar organization. And what steps has the authority done to comply with some of these findings? What we've done is that we're updating both our procurement policy and all of the policies regarding um, our financial management of funds and also overseeing of the programs. All right, and I see you plan to complete the 2021. So the 2021 and 22 <coughs> audits have begun? The 2021 is gonna begin in, in October and we're gonna, compl and we're gonna start the 2022 as soon as the uh, when the fiscal year is over probably in um by by January February very well um with regards to also within the testimony that was shared um the director executive director spoke about uh the construction of the new St. Croix disposal facility um, and the expansion of the Pavoni landfill along with the pre-construction activities. Uh, what's the status on that? Uh, you have a timeline? Mr. Isles, you wanna chime in on the, uh, on the convenience centers?
Yes, we have we do have a timeline for the convenience centers. The completion date is December 2023. December, okay. And you're and we've been working um go ahead. No, go ahead. No, we've been working with VIHFA on those timelines on a weekly basis. So we're trying to adjust them a little bit just because of where we are. And uh, that adjustment, you mean, uh, probably would have a completion at a shorter time period or? No, no, not in a shorter time frame, just to make sure that we're on track with that deadline. Got you. Uh, with regard to the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the Solid Waste Supplemental Grant, um, <laughs> what's the status on that? When was it awarded? Because I remember hearing about this grant. Two minutes. I think last year. Ms. Owls, I'll let you continue commenting. Sure. It was awarded to DPNR in 2021. <coughs> and we've been, we have to um, negotiate a MOA between the authority and DPNR. So that's um, that's the next step in that so for us to establish the MOA and um, get the funding for that. So you mean you still don't have an MOA with DPNR? Oh, one one minute, uh, please. Your names before you answer. That was just um, Juanita Isles. Please, names before you answer. Yes, Juanita Isles. Yeah, so we're you, in the final stages of working through that MOA. How long you've been working with this MOA? Because uh, you know I've been hearing about this grant now since I came into legislature, and um, and I can't believe we don't even have an MOA. Yes, it's been a long time working with them, especially on the work plan. The um, EPA, DPNR wants us to complete the work plan before we move on to the stage of the MOA. So we're be, we've been finalizing those details with EPA and DPNR to get that work plan com completed. So what's the timeline by when you think the work plan will be completed and the MOA will be completed? The, ti the timeline for that is, hold on. In my notes here in the timeline, it's September, 2022 for that, um, the MOA to be completed. And then the work plan? The work plan is, is, is we sent the final work plan to um, DPNR, so that should be, it was scheduled to be completed by the end of this month. So they have to review that work plan and give us the final okay on that. And, um... and uh... So is that also the solid waste management program plan that um, has to be developed through this grant? Time. Time. Yes. I'm not this, sure. This, this, this is Director Murray. Yes, it's, you're talking about yeah, the integrated sustainable uh, man materials, materials management program. Materials that's, that's, program. That's, that's part of this. So the work plan that we have submitted to DPNR, it has a component of it that talks about the, uh, the, the sustainable materials management plan. All right, well, my time has been called. Um, I'll, I'll chip in if I need to and anything else. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Carrion. Senator Fred Gregory, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the Waste Management Authority family. You know, as I sit here and I listen to the conversation as it relates to waste management, it's frustrating. And I know that as legislators, we want to do everything that we can to ensure that vendors are paid and employees are paid. But I wish to remind all of us that the Waste Management Authority has a board. The legislature created this entity. And I have sat here for the past four years 
and the conversation around waste management has not changed. Um, I will say that I want to I want to commend the director for um, looking into the septage disposal fee. So that'll be my first question, and please don't be long-winded. When do you intend to implement that assessment? Because it is a needed assessment. Just give me a quick timeline. Yeah, I'd, I'd say in the next 30 to 60 days, we're working with the consultant. Okay, to good, come. thank you for that. Um, sewer fees, um, what are you collecting from um, property, and, uh, property tax? Uh, that's what we've been working with the Lieutenant Governor's Office with the Senate to have. Have the, you received any funding this year? We have not. And that's an issue. So, you know, we continue to talk about giving when we don't have all of the information. The Lieutenant Governor's Office have a responsibility to transmit the sewer fees. What is what are you, what do you project mm -hmm. in sewer fees for FY 2022? What were your projections? Do you have that information? About 2 .5, I, I think as legislators, we have to look at sure. the entire picture and not at the emotional perspective around what's occurring with Waste Management Authority. What does um, property tax owe you? Because that's important. Yeah, we don't have that information in front of us. The, 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 what we would, in years past, what we've received from the, the government of the Virgin Islands has been a million dollars. But that's part of the reason why we're trying to work with the Lieutenant Governor's okay, a million dollars, which is insufficient, right? Right, And correct. again, I wish to remind all of us that the legislature created this authority. Now, um, I heard you made reference to, I can't remember what happened with the anti-litter and beautification, but I know what happened with the million dollars for the St. John Capital Improvement. But I also want to remind us, because, you know, it's important when we put things on the record, we circle the entire perspective. So when I came to this body in 2019, the budget for Waste Management Authority was $25 million. The legislature improved, imp increased that budget by $10 million. It's now $35 million. So, I mean, we don't make money, right? We don't make money, but we have a responsibility to figure out how to generate revenues. And there is a board of um, the Waste Management Authority, and that board has to take responsibility for this authority. Otherwise is they're not truly deserving to serve on the board. Revenues have to be generated. That's just part of the process. So it sounds like there's a lot of slacking going on, and the, the solution is to come before the legislature and say, give us $28 million. So let's talk about the $28 million. So um, is it that FEMA has said to you that the $5,079,000 5, that's owed that they're not going to pay it out to this government because you're asking for 28, 28 million. No. Those, yes or no? No, those are different um, right. So, fees. Right, so then why would you come before this body and ask for $28 million? We, am, we do not make money here. And this is why we have to be careful as legislators. Um, and let me ask, this $23.3 million that's owed by, um, from the local funds, and we giving money every year. So what we do, we sacrificing the vendors to take care of our vehicles. I would feel a lot better if waste management came to the legislature and said, listen. You're frozen, I think. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I may think cut off for a minute there. So I am at a real loss as to what's really going on with waste management and how they're operating. The operation is what's creating the issue with these waste haulers. And we can't continue to ignore that and say, okay, just get them the money. No, they have to be held accountable. So let me ask this other question. Two minutes. And as long as I've sat here... Um, because I'm looking at the contracts. Some of these contracts expire since 2017. And you mean to tell me up to today, these contracts and we don't have we don't have contracts in place to take care of these waste haulers, in particular that I'm seeing in front of me, and whoever else, the, the, those that deal with the water, the treat 
the wastewater treatment as well. What is going on? Our job is not to continue to supplement this while we see in all of this mismanagement. It's unsatisfactory. So help me to understand, Ms. Amiri. Please. Please. Well, from a proper from a procurement standpoint, we are in the process of updating um, with putting out solicitations and then also updating existing contracts. Because yeah. I mean, the plan is not to do obviously not to do that because we can't we can't operate in month to month contracts. So yeah. where are we sacrificing always hollows for our, our vendors overall, but we're doing everything else was was giving salary increases to top level management, but sacrificing always hollows. And then we're supposed to have this emotional perspective about this whole thing when you come before the legislature. I'm not going to participate in that. It's wrong. There must be some accountability. So help me. The, the waste haulers are on a month-to-month -month contract, and we're still paying them one of those month-to-month -month contracts. It's just a matter of we, we so need... So why you owe them $23 million? from 2017 out of local funds. I'm sorry. How much of this 23 million is is um is is tied to fiscal yet? This need to be broken now. How much of these local this 23 million is tied to FY 2022, FY 2021, FY 20, FY and, and, and all the way back. This need we need more information than than what's presented here. This Time. is not satisfactory. We need to understand exactly what's going on with Waste Management Authority. Okay, we can... Something we, is a myth. We can provide that information to you separately. Or we, we can, was we can my time you. called? <coughs> yes, it was. Um, and then there's another thing here that you have, the solid waste fees, right? When you were talking about the solid waste fees, you talk about becoming self-sufficient. I've had discussions with you because... We know that throughout the country, throughout the nation, throughout the world, residents pay something for their um, for their trash. We've talked about it. Y'all never double back with me on this. I see that you have something here talking about charging salary waste fees, and you're going to um, PSC. Admirable, admirable. However, when you responded, you talked about a million and something dollars. That's not sufficient. We play. We we are playing Mickey Mouse. We play in Sesame Street. This is a major multi-billion dollar industry, and we're having a million dollar conversation. We're going to PSC for an additional million, a million point seven. Uh, how how does that does that align? That, that's not what we're paying board members and, and, and chief executives like yourself for. Help me, please. Thank you, Help Senator me. Gregory. You may respond. Yeah, uh, this is Director Merritt Waste Management. <clears throat> no, what we what we were saying was with the PSC, we're going to go ahead and. Uh, meet with them and discuss fees associated with uh, on the commercial side on the waste for, for the wastewater haulers. So the the initial thought process for the authority is that you have the businesses that are using the services; they're getting paid for a service, and then they're coming to the waste management authority and not having to pay. So that's why we started off with the solid waste haulers, and so now we're you know, on the wastewater side. That's the the next phase, and then we will continue to to look at the other avenues, whether that's the, the you know, the, the, the billing of residents on both the solid waste and the wastewater side. That's why we're working with the Lieutenant Governor's office as well to, to start collecting the wastewater fees. So we would, that's part of the, our, our, our master plan, but we had to obviously had to start somewhere. So the start was the tipping fees initially. So we're continuing that process now. Turn to page 13 of 23 of the post audit report. Exhibit 8, Roman numeral 8. That amount is what we have outstanding, 38 million, 451,000, $25. So, <clears throat> um, that's, this is not totally correct. It's less than that. Okay, they, they're saying a that. number of them has <clears throat> pending payment. So that, that was my next question. Those that have pending payment, we have sufficient funds to pay those? No, so part of the, when we asked about the one-time appropriation, this is, this is part of that. There are some of the vendors in here, like for instance, the, the, uh, the VWNA Caribbean, the $2.8 million, that's a, that is a 
ongoing contract, so that needs to be divided by so many months. So that's not that shouldn't be that should not be included on here. That's Viola. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have a contract with them. We pay them X amount every month, but for some reason this got it got transcribed on here as if it's a balance that's due, and that's that's not correct. On SD SDNC. Yeah, the SDNC number is actually less than that. It's it's four million dollars. And SDNC is what wastewater. Correct. So it's four million because two million was recently paid with the last. Yeah, we we, we paid. Yeah, but so the 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 number was it was actually was eight million, and we paid them four million. So we only we so the outstanding balance is four million. Okay, so I'm asking again. All of those that have pending payment means that you have a mechanism in place as to how you're going to pay them. Oh yeah, the well, the mechanism is, is going to be a lot of misappropriations and uh, some of the some of the fees. Yeah, because you have the next sentence is insufficient, which is A9, Marco, SDNC. Those are insufficient, and those are like 20, you said take off two, so about 24 million for those three companies? Yeah, those, yeah that, these numbers are a little bit higher than they, because we made some, with the $14 million payment, there were some, so these numbers okay. are, should be a little bit lower. Senator Gittins, you recognize? Um, we we're looking at the numbers, and I'm really trying to see how um, we can best be able to solve some of these issues because um, it's a lot of local vendors that are owed, and they are owed for a long period of time. So I mean, no matter how you turn it or twist it or do anything, they're owed. And at some point, we have to find a mechanism to, to pay them, and that is why I moved that particular legislation. Are there other issues? Yeah, there, there are a lot of other issues, and a lot of is other issues that need to be solved, but this is in front of us, and I would regret the day that our wastewater or solid waste vendors say they're not going to work. And we started on St. Croix, and we saw an accumulation of garbage within a day and a half. The garbage dumps are deplorable. So we're playing with fire. I know in the AU, you might not want to support the monies that were set aside based on the fact that we know we have an excess in this budget. In this FY22 budget, because the departments have not filled vacancies, they've not spent the monies, and we know that this is a unique opportunity to be able to pay down some of those outstanding balances. Do we know that waste management need changes? Yeah, they do. You know, one of the first you got to, all the, the whole conversation with employees, you, you just got to deal with it. You just got to <coughs> deal with the conversation in reference to hazardous pay and, 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 and raises and how much vacancies we're we going to, to fill because maybe you don't need to fill 70. Maybe you need to make everybody fill 40 and be able to, to deal with, with, with the employees who are owed outstanding monies. But... You also have to deal with the skill set for the jobs. Certain jobs just come with a certain skill set. I mean, whatever, we could twist it, do whatever we want, but it comes with a certain skill set. It comes with, um, at times, applicable degrees in a particular area or, or, or job experience. And, and you really destroy morale when that happens. And it has happened throughout all, all over government. But you've you, you got to, to the best best way possible, you, you have to deal with that. You have to deal with whether or not all of your supervisory staff have the requisite skill set or the experience that they should be in that position. And if they don't, put them someplace else. I'm not saying to terminate anybody, but put them someplace else so that you could be able to move that authority without a bunch of disgruntled employees. As I, I'm sure all the senators are getting some type of text in, re text in reference to P or in reference to to something else that the um, that the staff has a, a, as a concern, Senator Gittins. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to all. Uh, Mr. Executive Director, uh, as we know, the. Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority was created under, uh, I think, Title 29 of the Virgin Islands Code, uh, Section 496. And you stated uh, 
in your testimony clearly that the Waste Management Authority takes its mandate to protect public health and preserve the environment of the U.S. Virgin Islands, among other things, very seriously. And back in June, I did make a call to your office with regards to a matter over in the Lorraine Village area uh, regarding uh, some trash that were piled up there that were creating a, a serious public health uh, issue, uh, which was a concern to me as well. Uh, neither here or there, I mean, it's, it's cleaned up now, but I didn't even get a response back uh, regarding that matter. But what I wanted to ask you is, um, does your agency issue uh, cease and desist orders? Uh, in reference, specifically in reference to... Any public health issue or, or uh, environmental <coughs> uh, hazard issue. Well, since I've been with the authority, we, we, have, not issue, we have not issued a cease and desist. You have uh, legal counsel on board? Yes, yes, yes we do. Uh, who is your legal counsel? Senator Florence Kahugu, legal counsel. Say your name again, please. Florence Kahugu. Uh, how long have you been with the authority? Since March 2022. 2022, so you just came on board. Correct, Senator. Have you seen any documentation where uh, the authority have issued any cease and desist orders? Not yet, Senator, but I know we've had conversations. I am sure that you have the full authority to issue those uh, within the realm of your authority uh, with regards to what you are able to do under the establishment of the authority. Precisely. Now, I am asking this because, again, uh, particularly here in the Island District of St. Croix, uh, you know, I guess I have to call it what it is. We have some hoarders uh, in the community. People uh, actually go to the dump site, pick up trash, and take it to their residential area. I've been calling Waste Management, Department of Health, Public Works, everybody in government, and then took it to the Lord in prayer. But we need some assistance, and particularly in the LaGrange area of Frederickstead, there's an individual that goes to the dump on a daily basis, multiple times, picking up trash from the dump site and bringing it into, uh, into the LaGrange area and putting it down on property that's not even his. And I'm saying Two minutes. whether it's waste management, whether it's Department of Health or whomever, I expect that when people reach out to the various uh, government agencies that you all put your heads together and address the matter. But this is a serious public health issue that needs addressing. The last entity that I spoke with was the Department of Health, uh, who stated that they will issue the cease and desist order. But after this hearing, I am, will be calling you to ensure that there is some type of coordination between the agencies, because really and truly, the residents don't want any more excuses after this. And I have personally witnessed it time and time again. Can you tell me how you can assist? Yeah, I say that we we would will work with the Department of Health and DPNR. We can actually go out to the to this location and uh, have one of our enforcement officers. We can issue a citation or a fine. But as far as if it's if it's 
let's say it's a, a let's say something happens at a bin site, then obviously it's waste management. But if it happens, but if it happens on someone's personal property, we don't we don't have the authority as our from an agency standpoint to do something. But we can assist and we can actually um, do a citation based off of the fact that you have you know illegally um, you know illegal waste from dump somewhere outside of where it's where it's supposed to be coll uh, collected and uh, disposed of. And I appreciate your response. However, the items are being taken from your bin site. Okay, so then that means that they're scavenging, which is also a uh, a violation. So if then what we can do is we can we have the uh, the cameras at our bin sites. So we can we can if we have a time period or time frame of when that person came to to uh, remove stuff from the bin site, then we can actually that's another violation as well. Um, so we'll, so yeah, I definitely let's let's you know we can we, we can have another conversation, and let's kind of let's move forward with, with uh, us and other agencies and try and make sure we resolve this. We will because I will not stop until I see that truck stop going there, picking up those trash, and keep going in and out that residential area. Time. Now, uh, I'll close with asking: I've seen your enforcement officers working on a daily basis, nightly basis alongside the Virgin Islands Police Department, et cetera, that during the COVID uh, pandemic. Have the Waste Management Authorities submitted all required documentations to the Office of Management and Budget uh, so that your officers can get their premium pay? I believe so, but let me, I will go back and check on that just to confirm. All right, through the chair, if you could, um, give it to them and I'm looking at your uh, your statement that um, every report that we read placing us at the top of the tourism industry could not happen if the people of the Waste Management Authority were not there to keep paradise clean and sanitary after every carnival and festival event that we celebrate as a community Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority is there to clean up uh, the environment as our motto states, we are proud to preserve paradise. We need to be uh, standing up for our employees as well to ensure that they get what is due to them. Thank you, and I'll, I'm looking forward to that information as to whether or not uh, that information was submitted for them. Okay, and this is Director Merritt. I, and let me make sure I, I apologize for the, so the, the rain community, we actually, as soon as we, as, as soon as I spoke with you, I worked with our staff to go ahead and set up something and clean it up. We put out a press release, but I did not call you back to let you know, so I apologize for that. But we were, as soon as you, you as soon as you brought it up, we went out there um, and worked with the community to go ahead and make the cleanup. And um, I, I literally, I thought you got the communication, and I just didn't follow up. So my, my apologies. I appreciate you. I, I know it was clean up because I went back and and did a follow up, but I didn't know who was doing what. All I was concerned about is that it be cleaned. But when I sit down and I pen a letter to to anyone and, and CC a copy or something, I just expect to get back out of respect, get a response back as to what action was taken. Yeah, my, my apologies you. for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gittins, Senator Johnson. Good, af good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to my colleagues. Good afternoon to the testifiers. Good afternoon to the viewing and listening audience. <coughs> I, I, I sit here and I, I can definitely see a part of rubber hitting the pavement. And you're going to get a lot of blows because at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. But until we get serious and understand that people garbage cannot continuously be picking up for free, you're going to have that problem. And we have to face it dead straight on. That's where the problem lies. You cannot pay out what you're not making. and You will continue coming to us for money to pay out. And we must find that comfortable ground where all residents are going to pay for their trash. It, it just cannot continue. It, it is what it is. And sometimes, <laughs> I just mean a politician that is sitting here. <laughs> politician, no, I tell people, people exactly what it is. Yes. But, but this is what it is. 
we cannot continue operating like this and get a good ending. It's not going to happen. I, I was listening to you and you were speaking about your saddle waste collectors, where they're going to pay, but they're going to only be paying for the private sector that they're picking up from. Is it fair to say that? Let's say if a private hall have a contractual agreement with a particular gated community, those are the ones that are going to start paying. Oh, this is director mayor. So those, so they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're paying. So they're, if they're picking up from a res, yeah, if they, if they have customers that they pick up trash, then when they come to the landfill, then they pay a tipping fee because they're, they're, they're making money from the, the, the collection of those different separate entities. So Correct. when they holla pick up from my house, I, I don't pay. You have to find money to pay them because you can't charge them for picking up mines because I don't pay. It is, it is what it is, direct. Level with me. I'm not here for games. I didn't come in here for games. No, it's not games. I think that so so the, the 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 definition of a tipping fee is that it's helping the landfill. You need to collect a a fee to help the landfill operate, pay for salaries, the staff. Um, when the landfill closes, there's a thirty thirty is called a, a post a thirty year closure post closure care period. So part of that money goes away into like a savings account and use that to help pay for any environmental issues related to the landfill at some point. So in essence, any trash that comes into the landfill should be, there should be a there fee. There should be some kind of collection associated for it. with it. Correct. And you're not getting from the majority of the people in the territory. Correct. End of the story. I want to ask you a question about your cameras. What's the cost for all your cameras and are you satisfied with what you're getting from these cameras? Um, the the exact, I think the, the cost for the cameras on phase one to phase two is roughly about maybe four to 500,000. We, we are, and, and so what we've seen is that we have, we're having to tweak the angles of the camera a little bit because they're, they're, some of them are not picking up the, uh, the licenses correctly. So we've been working with the, uh, the provider to, to make those modifications. But um, as I mentioned here on, uh, in my testimony, there's been a significant increase in, in citations, and part that's partly um, it's partly due to the fact that we had the cameras, and the cameras have have actually been. I, I think people realize that there's cameras now, and so I think that's making 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 people more cognizant of the fact that they have to do the right thing. I saw where you said 50 citations, and I I still think that's a small number. Two minutes. I think that's a small number because. When you look at the, the, the land, the, the, let's go to Concordia, and you could even use Mombiju. You could clean all the tires up today, and tomorrow the pile is, is back to the size. And, and I don't believe that it's individual dropping those tires there. Because the number of tires that come up, and that's why I'm asking about your cameras, because if your cameras are working right, you might be short with the amount of manpower you need, but you should be able to utilize those cameras for knocking citation, for catching people. And if, and if it's not doing that, we need to upgrade that because you're not going to have manpower on the ground every day. But those, those eye in the sky have to be efficient. What you spend on them, they have to work because that's the only way we're going to slow this down. At least on your site, it might end up in other areas. And I, and I, in speaking with my colleague, I, I have some amendment for that tire bill because we're going to have to stop the tires them from leaving the shop because they're not reaching back to folks' home as they say they're going to do and do a planter. They're ending up right in the dump site. And, and me and my colleague had some discussion on that, that we have to make some amendment to it so that these tires don't reach back on the spot. Um, you have a task ahead of you. It's a task that can be done. But that resource has to come in, and we have to find a way where we start having every individual pay for the trash. We cannot continue. Okay, so this is Director Merritt. I agree with everything you just said. I think um, one thing I want to want to add: the cameras. Um, so we're in, we're increasing our environment enforcement staff, and so we've hired the, hired inspectors. We have some more inspectors that are going to come online. So part of what we're doing now is from a coordination standpoint, we're saying that we want to have 
one of the inspectors look at the cameras. We're, gonna, we're putting together a protocol to say, let's look at the camera, look at the footage, go back, because you're right, everyone, you can't be out there every day, but if we, got the, we have this camera footage, let's look at it. So for instance, I was out at uh, Concordia picking up trash about a month ago, Time. and we were out there. I noticed you know, people coming in, and I would walk up to them, you know, drive up, and i say, hey, you're putting a refrigerator out. I'm like, hey, you can't do that. We got cameras sitting here. I'm just telling you, you got to take that to the landfill. And, you know, for the most part, everybody said, okay, well, I, you know, sorry about that. I didn't know. I saw tires. Somebody had a tire. He tried to pull the tire out. And I said, you know, you can't do that. He said, what about this big pile of tires? And I said, well, <laughs> we have a camera here, and we're going to go back and look at the last time we were out here and that, 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 that uh, pile wasn't that high. We're going to go back. We're going to figure out who brought all those tires. So if you want to be included in that, uh, be my guest, but he took his tire and went to the landfill. So we're we're so you're right. We're going to use the cameras to help determine who's actually accounting for that because there's no way that you have two tires here today and then all of a sudden there's 75 tires the next day. So we know that it's that it has to be a business. Mr. Chair, if I may just follow up on this, do do your your staff had ac have access to the cameras to view them randomly, or you have to go through the the, the Contractor. So we're getting no. So we're getting all of our. So our IT department has the the cameras. We can view it. He's given access to the enforcement department. So now they're just putting the protocol, the plan in place to say, okay, well, this today, part of you. Okay, so this week, part of your duty is one day Monday, uh, environmental inspector uh, A. This is you're going to do look at the cameras on Monday. Environmental inspector B. You're going to look at them on Tuesday. And then so we're going to have a process and a plan to go through. So we're so so that way we can, like you said, we can utilize the cameras as additional personnel to a certain extent because we can't be out there every day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have so many more questions, but this 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 thing about garbage being collected for free, we can't continue. I I, I know I'm going to get blows for it, and I'm not scared about that. We just can't continue like this. We really can't. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, um, Senator Johnson. Senator Francis, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to you, my colleagues. Good afternoon to the people of Virgin Islands, and of course, good afternoon to the Waste Management family. Director Merritt, how are you doing, man? <laughs> this is Director Merritt, Waste Management. I'm, 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 I'm here, working every day. You're here. Yeah. Got a lot on your plate. <clears throat> so, Recognizing that it takes $60 million to run your agency and your budget is only $36 million and your revenues is what, like $2 million? How do you feel about that? That's why I made a point to mention it in the, in the testimony so everyone understands the situation that we're in. Um, as much as, we're, okay, so I will say this, you know, waste management, we're doing our part in looking at our costs internally to figure out, you know, so like I mentioned for St. Thomas, um, we looked at some of the bin sites and said, hey, our guys can pick those up. We looked at um, over, over here on St. Croix, we can, we can do one of the bin sites. I mean, so we're looking and figuring out ways that we can save money because I don't want to, you know, necessarily come to the legislature and say, hey, we need $60 million and I have done nothing to contribute to helping us save money and you know, therefore create money or create revenue a certain, to a certain extent. So, so, you know, so as I'm talking to you about it, I'm saying, hey, this is what we're doing, too, in order to help, help save money, but we, but we need help. But this, this is a recipe for failure, though. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The reality of it, this is a recipe for failure. I mean, you're down $24 million, and still we're not even talking about turning a profit. You're simply talking about breaking even. It requires you to at least get $60 million. So that's, that's, that's rather difficult um, to do. So I'm, I'm not sure how much this body can be able to assist you because obviously, um, you know, again, you're going to have to um, implore this community to do their part and, and to really, you know, um, speak to the truth, speak the truth about what it requires to run the Virgin Islands Waste Management. How is the morale of, of your staff at this time? Uh, this is Director Merritt. I, you know, over the last two years, we've worked with staff. We mentioned earlier on the solid waste side and the wastewater side, we did salary increases, and they were retroactively back to October 2020. I think, um, and I, I've made a point to talk to our staff, um, and, I, and when I say staff, I'm saying our, our guys out in the field, because 
I, you know, I know what they do. It's a thankless job. And if the authority, if we're not making sure that they feel appreciated and, and I, you know, appreciation is not just a thank you, it's also a monetary appreciation. So that's why we, we made sure that we entered into these agreements prior to the um, agree, um, to the discussions with the union and the collective bargaining agreement so that when we got to that point, which is we're at now, they were going to be at higher salary. So then as we work under the CBA, then that would be slotted in at, 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 a, at a higher salary. So that was, <clears throat> that was something that we voluntarily did. The union didn't make us do, no one made us do that. That was something that we wanted to do to make sure our employees understood, you know, that we, we understand that they need to be compensated. And so we wanted to, to that was something that we did going forward without um, without the union. I also saw that you got a small bump in, in your salary. Did that come with any de deliverables? Are you required by the board to do anything um, in additional in order to earn that, yeah. that, um, that bump? Yes, it came with deliverables. It came with, you know, can things. You, can you just mention two or three of those deliverables? Um, uh, as far as revenue, go ahead and start coming up with, you know, actionable revenue items so that uh, obviously the tipping fee, um, being able to address issues associated with the consent decrees, working with the, uh, our federal partners with the Department of Justice and the EPA, making sure we have uh, good relationships as we continue to address things with the consent decree, coming up with other cost savings initiatives, and I mentioned the um, here of the last year, the $5.4 million. Two minutes. Uh, looking at other things to help from an operational standpoint on the landfills. So, um, I use that Rustmar foam, and it's actually saving us money, one, but two is also putting us in a much better situation with the, with the consent decree, also with the FAA and the airport, um, looking at internal costs, how to save money. So, so it had a variety of things. And in your, um, well, let's talk about WAPA. You still owe WAPA some money? What's, what's the, how much WAPA money waste management owes to WAPA? And what are you doing to pay down on that amount? Yeah, we owe up uh, approximately maybe three million dollars. We're working with uh, we 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 had a meeting with WAPA um, several months ago, prior to the new their their new chief executive, saying that we need to to discuss um, waste management in WAPA. And there's things that you know from a uh, from a collaborative standpoint. You know, there's some things that. We do for WAPA. That, so anyway, so we talked to them about um, how we can assist each other, then how that assistance turns into um, monetary, you know, incentives for both for, for both agencies. So we're we're having ongoing discussions with them because I think there's uh, there's some synergies in place, and so so in theory, in essence, they bill us every month, and we don't bill them, and so we said we have to, that that is a system. When we're talking about creating revenue for the authority, that is, from you just well, you know, the budget. Does that become a wash, or, or there's still a balance outside of that? No, there's that well, there's there's a, so the balance is about three million. It's about three million dollars. Okay. Um, did you submit that as as one of your proposal that's needed by um, in terms of your funding in this budget? Did you ask for that that three million dollars? No, we didn't. So so what we I, you know actually when I said the the additional money, I didn't even I didn't. I didn't even include that because that's a that's the utilities, so that wasn't even the operational portion. That was just something that. Um, so you have the funding to pay that? No. Time. No. <laughs> it's in the. It, you know what? Every everything, <laughs> everything that um, we do, it, you know, um, um, uh, I think Senator DeGraff mentioned it that the our the initial budget was was increased from 20, you know, you guys helped us increase the general fund from 25 million to 35 million. If you added that along with the other appropriations we were gonna get, it would have would have would have changed us from 32.3 million to 42.3 million. The, um, the, way, the way we get our allotments, we pay everything based off of, we get our allotment from the general fund and then when we got annual beautification and the other ones, we got those once a quarter. So then we would use, use that money just to pay our bills down every month. So, uh, hopefully that answers your, Bro, answers Mr. your Chair, question. I just got two more quick questions um, to wrap up. Proceed. The, um, on page 13 of 23, again, I know that um, the Chair had, had questioned you in regards to that, where there was some pending payment versus insufficient fund. But in this amount, there are some low-hanging fruits. There are some um, numbers that, that's really extremely low here. 
Um, in some instances, under $20,000, under $100,000. And what are you doing to at least address those low-hanging fruits and get them off of your register? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, um, as I mentioned to, uh, to, to the chair, some of the, this isn't totally accurate. So some of these, the, the smaller amounts, those are just a monthly amount. And somehow some of the monthly amounts got put in here as if they were outstanding debts that we hadn't, weren't paying. So to, so to your point, if we owe someone $20,000, if we can't pay, afford to pay somebody twenty thousand dollars, then we're in way more trouble than. <laughs> and that's what I'm thinking as yeah. well. So maybe you need to send in a, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, we, just, we have this has to be updated. And but yeah. what we're doing, yeah, we this we'll we'll make sure we we uh, send an updated version of this to uh, to post audit, so they have a, a an actual reflecting of a true reflection of of what's owed. But we. The, the smaller, these smaller amounts, these five or ten thousand dollar amounts, we pay those on a monthly basis. And my last final question, um, because my time is up, is in respect to the sewage in the Christian Set Town area. I, I know that there was some um, some backup occurring, and that has been happening for quite some time. Have waste management been able to address that um, the backup sewage um, that's happening in the Christian Set Town area? Yeah, Jeff. I mean, I can. I'll just. Say, I can say this: that we've had our one of our contractors, one of our um, our trusted contractors, Marco Saint Croix, came out and did some stuff in the King Christian area, um, and he's also doing some uh, some work that we mentioned earlier. As far as uh, some of the uh, some of the major funding that we that we have, he's working on he's working on a project that's going to hopefully alleviate um, all that. But we there was a temporary fix that we did about um, maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and that. That that helped, and then now the overall project that he's doing is going to actually should, should fix everything. But Jeff, if you want to, so that would pave the way for the road construction to be done because that's what mm -hmm. I really want to get to the road construction. But I yes. figured that the switch was the impediment um, to that. The so that now will pave the way for you to be able to do the road construction in the Christian Set Town. Yes, it should. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, I don't want to steal your your thunder if you want to comment too. Good 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 afternoon, uh, Jeff Watson engineering manager. Yes, uh, specifically um, in Christianstead, we do have a notice to proceed by uh, a contractor to do that work. Uh, as um, Director Merritt mentioned, we did some preliminary fixes in the, uh, by the Comanche, Ho uh, Comanche Hotel recently, and also by King Christian, uh, by King Christian uh, Hotel. But a notice to proceed was issued to a contractor and uh, a pre-construction meeting uh, has not been held yet. We're waiting on a schedule from, from the contractor who needs to get his materials uh, on site. Uh, materials are going to be, getting materials on site is going to be a challenge. We've got, we've got over uh, 30,000 feet of 8-inch pipe to, to be ordered for that Christianstead job. But we are um, on schedule to have that job started, to be able to coordinate with Department of Public Works and other agencies. Of course, waste management, we've got to get in there first, put our sewer lines in, and uh, have, have the other agencies coordinate accordingly. Yeah, and then let me, this is Director Merritt too. Let me just, just also add this. So, so to his point, we've been working with DPW, with uh, WAPA. We're trying to make sure that we are, when we go, when we go in there and do work, that it's, it's a one time and everybody, so we're trying to make sure we coordinate with all the other utilities. Okay, thank you so much. So this is starting, when was it started? Yeah, this, this work started, what, about 30, 30 days ago, 45 days ago? Oh. Yeah, about that, but the, uh, this this is Jeff Watson again. Um, the notice to proceed was issued. However, the pre-construction meeting has not been held yet. And, and the reason for that is that we've got to develop a schedule. And that schedule is going to be dependent on when the, when the contractor expects uh, materials. So I'm expecting to have uh, input from the contractor uh, within, a, within a couple of weeks. So we can have that pre-construction meeting and uh, uh, very, so, very shortly. Mr. So Watson, you need to speed that up, okay? It's only been about four years that back of Christians that have been in a state of disrepair. So try to speed up the meeting with a contractor so we could get this project going. It's been a long, long time. 
Senator Gittens, you have a point. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, Executive Director Merritt, are you aware, I mean, are you familiar with the Wilfred, uh, well, Wilfredo Pedro uh, Housing Community, also known as Wim Garden? Uh, this is Director Merritt, yes. Uh, you have a project or had a project in, in that specific area? D Jeff, do you, um, do you, would you like to come in? I know we did, we did some work in that area recently. Uh, who who's online there to comment on that? Jeff, right, Will, Jeff Wilford Pedro. I'm sorry, I wanted to get that name correctly. Wilford Pedro Housing Community. You no, know, uh, Senator, I'm I'm not I'm not up to date on on that particular project. All right, I'm, I'm gonna be short. Uh, Executive Director, what I would like is for you to personally take a look at that project. The road was uh, dug up. I think you've completed um, the replacement of those uh, pipes in that area. However, the road is left in total bad shape. Okay. Uh, that's a senior uh, community uh, area. And if the ambulance has to go in there for anyone, God forbid, uh, they won't be able to start an IV line uh, coming out of there with a patient in the back of that ambulance. So I'm asking you to take a look at that because whenever uh, you, WAPA, or whomever dig up the road, the law is is that you fix the road back as you met it or in better condition. Okay, this is Director Merritt. So I was, uh, I just remember we there was some work that we did out there here recently, but it was, um, we had to, there were some some odor issues out there, and we had to we put some uh, odor control out there. But I will have our engineer go out there, um, take a look at the roads, and um, then we'll contact the contractor and make sure we we uh, do any any um, make any repairs to um, the work that we did. Please, because we had the um, Virgin Islands uh, Housing Authority here yesterday, and they said that they have made the pleas. So I'm asking you to uh, personally take a look at that and ensure that those seniors can get in and out of there uh, smoothly and safely before there's an emergency. Okay, we'll, Thank we'll you. definitely right. do that. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Gittens. A quick point of inquiry, Senator Johnson, and then we're gonna close out. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, on page 28, you spoke about in-house collection, and you spoke about St. Thomas and St. John. You're saying in this you have trucks on those on both islands that doing in-house collection this is director merit yes we do no trucks on the island of st croix we do so we're doing uh, so we we have um roll-off trucks on st croix and we don't have any reloader trucks so bin site collection we're doing in-house in bin site collection at cotton valley the contractors are doing concordia and mom bijou um, and as far as the the in-house collection on st croix so it's, it's contractors Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Johnson. Uh, Director, I'm going to give you an opportunity to put a closing statement on the record, but I just um, want you to remember to deal with those employee issues. We have a lot of work to do. Um, we should be able to move waste management forward, but it, it has to begin um, with making sure that uh, the employees are taken care of and that they feel that they're being dealt with uh, fairly. And I think if you do that, we'll be able to move forward, reanalyze all of the positions. Positions should have certain job specification as to what type of background you should have for that particular position. And if we don't put that in place, you know, I'm, I'm not going to um, have a master's degree and you hire somebody with a high school diploma, you put them over me and they don't even have any experience in, in that particular um, area. If they have 25, 30 year experience, then you might say, you know, they're, they're very experienced, so they, they have that ability to supervise that particular section. But if not, all you're doing is creating animosity. And once the animosity builds up, it's very, very hard um, to get rid of it, you know. So reevaluate re uh, some of the stuff that, that you're doing. But I'll allow you to put a closing statement on the record and we'll continue to support the Waste Management Authority.
Okay, well, this is Director Merritt again. I would like, like to thank the uh, legislature for the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of uh, waste management. I'd like to thank all of our, our staff. Uh, that we have a very dedicated staff that uh, go above and beyond to make sure that we provide um, solid waste and wastewater collection and disposal services here in the territory. Um, as I mentioned in our um, in my testimony earlier, I, I think that we are one of the most uh, important and critical agencies in the territory. Um, and I would just like to say that, uh, like I said, I will let our let our staff know that we appreciate all their efforts and, and all their hard work. And, and you know, as we mentioned, from a funding standpoint, um, you know, you know, getting 36 million and, and the true operational cost is is, is uh, 60 million. Um, any assistance that the um, legislature can provide to, to help um, narrow that gap would be appreciated. We are continuing to look in-house at ways that we can continue to save money, whether that's through in-house collection or different operations um, on, the, on both the solid waste and wastewater side. So we're continuing to do that as well. So, so thank you for the opportunity to, to talk today. Thank you so much, Director. Uh, this concludes the finance hearing for today. The Committee of Finance is hereby adjourned.